group, they'll be able to invite in speakers on a, a wide variety of topics instead of being pigeonholed uh, and kind of handcuffed by the UFO subject. So that if I had to venture a guess, that would be my guess, that they're, they're kind of opening up uh, the possibilities for uh, speakers and information that may all dovetail with UFOs, but won't fall exclusively under that particular category. So I think this is going to be the first of many moves that we see uh, within MUFON and other groups that people are just going to start branching out and, and becoming more autonomous. Well, the thing here is when you have something like that, you have each of these groups being capable or presenting the threat or promise of starting a new national organization under a new umbrella. And here we go again. Yeah, I, I think in the case of L.A., it's going to be more of a grassroots uh, kind of northwestern sort of L.A. area, um, San Fernando Valley group that is going to be more active in other aspects of the paranormal. Obviously, I've seen online already people saying, well, the reason why they're, they're doing this is because move on is a black hole. All the reports come in uh, and nothing comes out, which... It no longer is true. They do have a a digital database. It's fairly unwieldy. It's it's very difficult to uh, to actually pull anything out of it. But you can if you're if you're persistent and you know how to to uh, properly language your search terms and 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 whatnot. But I really have a sense that uh, the real motivation for this is to open up uh, the group to. A wider variety of subject matter and speakers, and 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 I think that's a good thing because uh, you know me, Gene. I've I've been championing this whole idea of interconnectedness for for many years, and and if you're just a single subject uh, group, you're you're handcuffed, you're you're hogtied to that particular subject, and you may want to try to branch out and and bring in other other aspects of of the so-called paranormal but the national organization has some pretty strict um guidelines and uh, bylaws about uh, about that and and i think that uh we're going to be seeing more groups spinning off uh obviously the political uh, problems that mufon has undergone some of the controversy around robert bigelow some of the kind of tempest in the teapot about the uh the latest uh director and his mile high flights and you know, I'm not worried about his business. I don't care what he does for a living as yeah, long but, but as it's legal. All but kind of, they all roll up into a big sort of uh, negative column uh, in the equation. And Well, obviously, and, politically correct, that's not. I mean, people don't talk about it in public that much. But someone who does something like that, you know, it adds to the controversy faced by the organization. But there's another issue, too. As listeners are listening to this episode of the PowerCast, MUFON is having their annual event in Las Vegas, and this year Stephen Greer is one of the featured speakers. No. And, and you have to think here, we have to look at the fact that Greer is a controversial figure. Maybe he's a draw. Maybe he brings people into the auditorium to pay. But he also has done some very controversial things, things that may not be so, as they say, kosher. And therefore, having that person featured more and over and above just having people talking about the fact that UFOs may not be a single phenomenon but related to other paranormal events, that's one thing. But bringing in speakers who have a checkered history, that doesn't look good for the organization. And no one says anything about it. Yeah, that's true. I mean, lately there's been quite a bit of banner online about about uh, a certain person I feel is highly highly um, important in this field, and that's Ray Stanford. Now, he, as some people have pointed out, uh, over the past 50 years, there have been times where he has gone, kind of veered off the straight and narrow and gone into the realm of, of channeling, gone into, into the realm of attempting to help people with his um, higher self. He's he's never claimed to channel channel entities or or beings. It's always been uh, his higher self speaking to his conscious self. Much to the um, you know that's that's not how people are looking at his past. I think online, uh, which is highly inaccurate. But 
With Stephen Greer, it's, it's different. Uh, the guy has pretty much maintained a very predictable course throughout his uh, 20, 25 years uh, of involvement in the field. And he has come up with some very definitive declarations about what he thinks we're dealing with. And one is that all ETs are positive. And there is just volumes of information that show how this particular slam dunk sort of case closed, slam the door thinking is incorrect. And we do have other things going on. For instance, he, he equates all abductions with the U.S. military. Now, I'm sorry, that just doesn't, that doesn't wash. Now, granted, the UFO phenomenon may or may not be involved in the abduction phenomenon, although there's quite a body of, of circumstantial evidence that would suggest that. But you can't make such blanket assertions and blanket statements and expect people who are healthily skeptical, open-minded, but healthily skeptical, you can't expect those people to really take you seriously. And the fact that MUFON is grasping at straws and I think trying to get uh, butts in the seats, basically, by, by having Greer, uh, any time that he shows up at, a, at an event, uh, he's basically there because he's a draw. We have to draw this to a close, and it's a valid point of discussion which will continue on future episodes. Meantime... Mac Maloney returns to the Paracast. He's author of a new book called Beyond Area 51. Let's check it out. You're in the Paracast. Attack of the Rockoids has been well received by critics and readers alike. It's a -a thrill-a-minute story you'll never forget. A former U.S. military intelligence officer is haunted by intense dreams about a beautiful woman pleading for his help after a terrible battle in outer space. But the dreams turn out to be true and thrust him into a telepathic love affair with a woman whose faraway planet is intent on destroying the Earth. And now the gripping tale continues in The Coming of the Protectors. It's the second book of the Rockoids trilogy, a galaxy-spanning adventure that pits our hapless heroes against powerful, fanatical enemies that threaten the lives of freedom-loving beings everywhere. Attack of the Rockoids and The Coming of the Protectors, classic science fiction at its best, available now. For more details, visit rockoids.com. That's R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S dot com. Have you ever felt like the United States government knows way too much about your financial affairs? I continue to hear stories about property seizures, frozen bank accounts, confiscation of stocks and bonds. It makes me wonder if the U.S. citizen will ever again have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Unfortunately, with the Drug and Money Laundering Act, the IRS Revenue Ruling 6045 of 1984, and the Trading with the Enemy Act and Franklin D. Roosevelt's Executive Order of 1933, some precious metal holdings are subject to government intervention. For this reason, Midas Resources has prepared a report explaining the boundaries of trading precious metals privately. Whether if you have any intention of trading with Midas Resources or not, I have instructed my representatives to give this report out free. Call for your free copy at 1-800-686-2237. When investing, always proceed with caution. Again, call 1-800-686-2237. Exercise your legal right to trade metals privately. 1-800-686-2237. To thank you for being a loyal listener, we have a limited-time freebie offer for you. Claim your free heirloom tomato seeds. Just pay shipping. Right now at 123freeseeds.com. These aren't ordinary seeds. These are heirloom, non-genetically modified super seeds that are open pollinated and can be grown, harvested, and replanted endlessly. These survival seeds are actually more valuable than gold in a crisis. Go to 123freeseeds.com and you can get an airtight storage packet of 150 super seeds free while supplies last to say thank you for being a loyal listener. First come, first served. Just cover shipping. Go to 123freeseeds.com now to see if your free heirloom seeds are still available. That's 123freeseeds.com. America, pay attention. 
Don't wait for the next natural disaster or fight for global domination to prepare yourself with Chef 5-Minute Meals. These delicious self-heating homestyle meals are five-year shelf-stable and require no water, no refrigeration, no microwave. Tasty enough for Rachel Ray, tough enough for the apocalypse. Get yours at Chef5MM.com or call 888-959-6502. Don't depend on the government. Be ready. Chef, the number 5, MM.com. Introducing the only portable solar generator in the world that uses advanced sun tracking technology. The Sun Socket Solar Generator from Aspect Solar, featuring 60 watt rotating solar panels, a built in 250 watt hour lightweight lithium iron battery that charges in only five hours, multiple output sockets, and more. See it in action at AspectSolar.com or call 877 717 7778. The Sun Socket Solar Generator. Stay plugged in. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. We're back on the Paracast with Gene and Chris. Now, going back to November 27, 2011, we featured Mac Maloney, who was author of a new book called UFOs in Wartime, What They Didn't Want You to Know. It follows then that we look this time beyond Area 51, all those strange installations around the world, and what they're really about, and is the purpose more than just the military or civilians checking new test aircraft? What's going on? Mac, welcome back first to the PowerCast. Thanks for having me back. I appreciate it. Beyond Area 51, anytime we hear Area 51, the title, it's a seller. But how much of the book deals with Area 51? Well, almost none of it. In fact, um, the idea that um, I uh, pitched to my editor was, let's write a book about Area 51 that isn't about Area 51. Because there were so many books out about Area 51, I think it's been kind of, you know, not done to death, but, you know, there's a glut of them. And there always seems to be. So he wanted to know what I meant, and I said... You know, there are many places around the world, like Area 51, that you don't really hear that much about. So why don't we do a book on them instead? So he said yes, and, you know, this was the result. Here we are. Okay, before we go on, maybe take a couple of minutes here. In the end, what do we know about Area 51, good or bad, and then we can go into the other locations? Well, what we know for sure is that it serves a legitimate military purpose. It's a place where the U.S. Air Force and the CIA, to a certain extent, test spy planes, test new kinds of weapons, always some kind of aeronautical uh, test going on there. There's, for every kind of project, secret project that finally comes out for us to see, let's say, by like the stealth fighter or the stealth bomber, there are eight or nine that never see the light of day. So they're always testing something out there, something usually exotic, and if it actually makes it into the production process, we'll know about it, you know, anywhere from five to ten years. They definitely do things like that out there. They used to do things like fly captured Russian airplanes uh, to have our pilots dogfight against them, and they would also pull them apart out there and, and kind of see what made them tick. Those things we know they do there, whether they have crash UFOs there, whether they have alien bodies there, so on and so forth, you know, I don't think anyone really knows that, you know, on the outside within the UFO community. Obviously, there's a lot of stories and rumors and everything, but... There's nothing to verify that anything well, like that. Dan Burge knows. I mean, that, that's where J Rod is, and the uh, the God particle, and all no. these like Annie Jacobson. Didn't she say Joseph Mengele uh, was involved out there? I mean, the, I don't. Be- well, I don't know if you believe any of that, but I don't no. believe. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, I I come across pretty dry this morning. Uh, no, I I don't think all those things are going on there. Even the Bob Lazar story. There are certain things that indicate that he may have been shown things to see if he would blab and, and talk about it. Well, we went to that in the book, and, you know, I found it a very reasonable explanation for why Lazard did what he did. And I've heard lately now that he runs a company that, you know, does business exclusively with the Defense Department. There was always a kind of rumor that he was really just a disinformation agent. And um, the, what we go into a little bit in the book is that maybe the reason he did what he did was before he came out and told the story about Apus Lake and uh, S4 and these places. The Russians used to uh, 
uh, have a uh, satellite go over Area 51 sometimes twice a day, but on a regular basis. After his story went out, the Russians actually diverted their satellites to go over Papoose Lake instead, and that gave a break to the people who were working at Area 51 on these secret airplanes because what they would have to do is, when they knew the Russian satellite was coming over, they had to you know, push the thing into the hangar and, and hide it until the satellite went over, and then later on when the Russians had infrared satellites, they could actually take a picture of the heat signature on the ground, and they could tell a lot just by the shape of the heat signature. So if they could even get uh, the Russians to stop looking at Area 51 by a factor of 50%, that would have been a victory. And that's exactly what happened after Lazan came out with his story. So, you know, if that's true, it was a brilliant disinformation campaign that worked. All right. So let's just go through this one more time. Bob Lazar, therefore, would have been meant to be a deliberate effort at government misinformation? Um, disinformation, yes. I'm, I'm not even sure there's a difference, but yes, he was a disinformation uh, agent. It's something that they do all the time. And, you know, uh, intelligence projects, you know, we just don't hear about them, but, you know, spy stories are filled with them. It's one of the things that, that they do. There's disinformation, deflect, things like that. And if you kind of look at it in that light, in the fact that Russian satellites did divert over Papoose Lake, at least for a while, then, you know, it, it, it kind of makes more sense than the fact that he was running into aliens and and, um, you know, saw crashed UFOs flying and things of that nature. Unfortunately, people take Lazar seriously. Some do. Some feel he was an honest broker who well, got involved in something maybe a little bit over his head. You know, maybe maybe he got in over his head at being a, a government agent. But I but people have told me and I don't I don't think it's any big dark secret now that he runs a company that deals uh, with the Defense Department um, selling, buying and selling certain items that, you know, aren't readily available on the open market. You know, so, I mean, if, if he was someone who was who he claimed he was, the Defense Department certainly wouldn't be doing business with him now. Ah, well, that's something. That's an indication there of fakery. But is there any chance, any possibility at all that the goings on at Area 51 do involve our paranormal universe? Well, in a way, I'd like to think so. But, you know, I just didn't see any concrete evidence. Of course, there's a lot of uh, evidence out there that is not concrete. But I've known people who, who have been out there. I know people who have flown out of there. I know the person who used to be the public affairs officer for the place. And, you know, of course, when you ask these people questions, you know, they're not going to tell you, uh, you know, what, if there are UFOs out there or not. But there just doesn't seem to be any kind of concrete evidence that anything is going on out there that has to do with the paranormal. Now, are we flying things that may, you know, look like UFOs when they're airborne at night? Sure, anything is possible. Who knows what kind of an advancement they had, you know, aviation-wise out there. But, you know, there's just no evidence now or in the past that indicates that anything is going on at Area 51 other than, you know, testing of top-secret aircraft. Okay, now, in looking at these other installations around the world, going beyond Area 51, are they also strictly places to do military testing, or is there something more exotic than the conventional? Well, that's the thing. That's what we try to look into. And, and you know, we just present evidence, and, you know, the reader, for the most part, has to make up uh, their own mind. But I can tell you that these bases, that in these, the, some of them are military bases, some of them are, are just areas like uh, the St. Louis Valley, where no matter what they're doing out there, every one of these places, with the exception of two, has some kind of a UFO history to it. And, and that in itself, I think, it is very interesting. A lot of the secret bases are, are bases where they do highly classified work here in the United States, currently in the Air Force Base being one in New Mexico, Homestead Air Force Base that used to be down in Florida, places like that, and, and certainly the bases that surround uh, our bracket, the St. Louis Valley in Colorado. You know, they, they all have highly classified things going on, and yet they all have this kind of history of UFO sightings, people spotting UFOs, people seeing planes, you know, uh, disappearing, all kinds of stuff. And, and we'll have more kinds of stuff coming right up. Lots of stuff to present with Mac Baloney. I'm Gene, and he's Chris. You're in the Paracast. America's number one source for independent talk radio for over a decade. We are... 
the GCN Radio Network. If you want to get your website online and you need reliable service, first-class service at the lowest possible price, there's only one place to go. Well, DreamHost has a special promotion with our show where they'll offer you unlimited disk space, unlimited bandwidth, one-click web apps such as WordPress, 24-7 support. You can save over $55. You want to know how? Go to DreamHost.com slash radio, DreamHost.com slash radio. Whether it's personal mail, whether it's business email, you want reliable, dependable delivery, freedom from spam, freedom from viruses. Well, Polaris Mail offers professional email hosting services for your personal or small business use. Each account uses 25 gigabytes of storage, an easy-to-use webmail interface, and full mobile sync. Sign up today for a 30-day free trial at PolarisMail.com, PolarisMail.com. What does freedom mean to you? How about the freedom to take control of your own future? At eFoods Direct, we're again celebrating Food Freedom Month in July. For every $329 you spend on our highly nutritious, great-tasting food, you will receive a $190 Patriot Pack free. For example, purchase a six-month supply and get three Patriot Packs free. The Patriot Pack is a 24-day supply of eFoods quick-fix, easy-to-store food, plus stove, fuel, and cook pot all in an easy-to-carry bucket. Patriot Packs are the ideal grab-and-go emergency kit for your car or to have by the back door. Perfect for your cabin or camping trip this summer or even simply to add more food to your supply free. Call 800-409-5633 or go to eFoodsDirect.com slash Alex and get your free Patriot Pack with purchase. Call 800-409-5633 or eFoodsDirect.com slash Alex. And remember, free shipping every day. Ouch! My back is out again. Hi, Dr. Ortman with Wellspring Spinal Care. If you're experiencing neck, mid, or lower back pain, this information is for you. One of the complaints that I hear is patients receive their typical adjustment, only having to repeat them as the pain returns. Putting the bones back in place is only half of the battle. At Wellspring Spinal Care, we have the entire solution. We use the NUCA approach, utilizing three-dimensional x-rays and gentle touch technology to deliver specific correction. We then design Design a custom nutritional supplement program which provides essential nutrients targeting the areas of concern. With a NUCA approach and proper nutrition, you'll be on your way to a faster and more permanent recovery. To get you on the road to wellness, visit DrOrtman.com. That's Dr. O-R-T-M-A-N.com. Or call us today, 952-303-9124. That's 952-303-9124. Wellspring Spinal Care, chiropractic done right. Hi, my name is Stephen Hewer. As a degree nutritionist, my first priority is for you to get healthy. That won't happen if I make wrong recommendations or cause you to spend money on supplements you don't need. After 20 years working with thousands of products and thousands of people, I know, for the most part, what does and does not work. One World Whey is the first and only unheated whey protein powder from grass-fed cows on the market. It retains substances that no other whey protein powder has. These nutritive compounds supply life-giving nutrition. Your body merely needs the right conditions to make great health happen. Due to low-quality foods, toxicity, and aging, having great health is more of an effort than ever. One World Way is the superfood of the century, and when added to your diet, it promotes energy, detoxification, muscle gains, fat loss, and overall radiant health. Call 888-988-3325. That's 888-988-3325. Or visit OneWorldWay.com. That's OneWorld, W-H-E-Y.com. This is Jerome Clark, author of the UFO Encyclopedia and other books. You're listening to the Paracast. With Gene and Chris, we've got Mac Maloney. We're looking beyond Area 51 to other installations around the world that may serve the same purpose or some more intriguing purposes. But with the rumors still existing in the UFO field that somewhere we are looking over the wreckage of a crash UFO, is there any evidence anywhere that such a thing is happening? No, there's no concrete evidence, no. Um, we have a story in there that, you know, we've, uh, I've been following for a few years, and we looked into it for the book about, uh, it's semi-famous, about Jackie Gleason and Richard Nixon. 
at Homestead Air Force Base. Uh, the story goes that back in 1974, Nixon, Nixon discovered that Gleason was a huge UFO fan, which he was, um, brought him to a hangar at Homestead Air Force Base and supposedly showed him a crashed UFO and also the bodies of the occupants. There's some interesting threads of evidence for that. Um, but, you know, we just kind of report what the story is, and, and people really have to kind of make up their mind whether it's true or not. Uh, one thing we know for sure is Jackie Gleason was very much into UFOs, and he not that was just one incident in his in his lifetime where he was trying to convince people that UFOs existed. So if Nixon had actually showed him a crash UFO, dead occupants, that would have just reinforced his belief that you know these things are from somewhere else and that they exist. Well, I know that Jackie Gleason had a skeptical approach to UFOs. He was a guest on the Long John Nebel radio show a number of times. So that's he, certainly he, accurate. When he died, he had 2,000 UFO-related books in his library that his wife donated to the University of Miami. His house up in upstate New York was... Shaped right, like his house looked saucer. like a flying saucer. And the story is, is that um, I think what why people have discounted the story in the past is that, you know, the, the, story, the way the story goes is that they were golfing buddies. They seem like two very opposite people, Nixon and Gleason, but they were golfing buddies. They lived down south of Miami. Nixon had a house down there, Key Biscayne, and Gleason lived down there for a good part of the year. And they were golfing one day, and Gleason, you know, mentioned that he was into UFOs. And then supposedly that night around midnight, Nixon knocks at his door. Nixon's alone in a car. And he brings Jackie Gleason to Homestead Air Force Base and shows him this thing. So people say, well, how can Nixon be out without a Secret Service detail? Well, it turns out he used to give them the slip all the time. He used to just ride around by himself. He hated having the Secret Service around. Um, and probably to... in those days, people didn't care. Right. You know, I mean, he was in the midst of the Watergate uh, scandal. He'd be gone in a few months. Um, maybe kind of unusual thing for him to do, but, you know, who knows, you know. And then later on... Uh, Jackie Gleason's, uh, his estranged wife, gave an interview to a magazine in which she kind of recounted this thing. And when Gleason found out about it, he was furious. And there's some people who say that that was the, the last straw, and that's why he um, divorced her. So, you know, there's, it, it seems like a, I don't know, kind of a fantastic, fantastic story when you first look at it. But when you look a little bit deeper into it, you know, as I said, there's a few more threads of evidence there than you would think. Okay, but how do we prove such a tale today? I don't know. You know, I don't know. I do know that, um, well, the, the way that the book is constructed, the first chapter, I go out and have some, have a few beers with a friend of mine who works in the intelligence agencies, works with the intelligence agencies, someone I've known since grade school. I ask him, can you please kind of guide me? You know, here and there, I, I would send him portions of the book once I had written the first draft, and I asked him, can you tell me, if I'm too far off here, and so on. And he also agreed to meet with me after the book was was completed. And someone said the other day that he's like Molly's ghost walking with me through the Christmas carol. But it isn't quite like that. But he pops up every once in a while <laughs> to just give kind of like the intelligent community's view about different places we talk about. Let me and ask you very me, quickly. This is a real guy. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah okay, absolutely. because sometimes people have these alter egos no, in no, books. No. Real guy and just someone, as I say, grew up in the hood in Dorchester with him. And, you know, he I went my way and he went his and uh, we got back together and um, uh, we, we hooked up again. And he was uh, someone who had spent 25 years in the army, a lot of it in army intelligence and now, you know, works for the three letter agencies. And he told me that um, he was at MacDill Air Force Base in Florida and, and that someone had told him that whatever was at Homestead, had been moved to McDill. Now, is is what was at Homestead, the flying saucer that, and the bodies that Jackie Gleason was shown by Richard Nixon? I don't know, but something very, very secret moved from Homestead after Hurricane Andrew really basically blew it off the map, and now is at McDill. So whatever it is, it's there. Okay, what about something like Roswell? If there was a crash of a UFO at Roswell, where would the wreckage be now? What about the bodies of aliens. This is obviously a theory that is compounded by another theory. Well, the point of the book, too, is that there are just many, many more places than Area 51. 
In fact, the original idea for the book was years ago I talked to this person who had been out there several times, not doing intelligence work, but basically working on the airplanes that flew out of there. And I said, you know, are there places like Area 52, 53, 54, and so on? I would basically ask him, are there other places out there in that desert, that vast desert, that we don't know about? And he said, sure. There's a, there's a number of them there in other places in the southwest. And that's really the idea for the book. So, you know, if there was a crash at Roswell, which I don't, really don't believe there was, and I know I'm not being much fun today, but I don't believe anything happened there either. You know what? But I'll ask you about that in a moment, but let's go to the answer to the original question. Then we'll ask your opinion about Roswell. Well, I was I was going to say if if it seemed like the um, the most likely place you would bring something like the Roswell debris would be to Area 51. But what I'm saying is there's a number of other places we've never heard at of that. If you had material like that, you're more likely bring it there than Area 51 or Wright Patterson or any of these places. You bring it to a place that is absolutely secret, and they are out there. For example, well, one place is which is very unusual, is a place called Tonopah, Tonopah Test Range, or Tonopah, Tonopah Air Force Base. It's in the middle of Nevada. It's about 100 miles north of Area 51, also known as Tonopah Air Force Base. This is the place that during the, in the 70s they tested the stealth fighter in complete secrecy for 10 years. They only flew it at night. Everyone who was at the base was under you know strict concern, uh, security concerns. Anyone who in the small town nearby who knew about it kept their mouths shut. There was a lot of people involved in this, and not one bit of information ever leaked out about the stealth fighter until it, it was very close to being revealed anyway. Um, the stealth fighter has been out of Tonopah now for almost 15 years, and but they have this huge infrastructure there that was built simply to hide classified projects. It's still there, and as someone once told me, keeping things top secret is very expensive, so it isn't like the government is going to go build another place when they have a place on the map that they know they can keep something secret. So if, if, if I was in charge and I had debris from a UFO and I wanted to be absolutely secret, one of the places I would consider is definitely Tonopah Test Range. All right. But let's go back to the next question that follows. Roswell, what do you think happened? Was it a mogul balloon like the Air Force says or what? Yes, I think it was. It was... Um, Something that, I mean, there was a cover-up, but the cover-up involved sending these balloons over Russia with acoustic devices on them to see if the Russians were testing nuclear weapons. Um, at the time, Russia was not quite our ally, but they weren't our enemy, and that would have been inconvenient if they knew we were spying on them. They didn't want anyone to know that we had this capability. So I suppose it, you know, when one of them crashed, someone had the bright idea to say, well, look, at, we can't say it was one of these spy balloons, so we'll say it's a flying saucer, because flying saucers had just been, quote-unquote, discovered, you know, just not even two weeks before by Kenneth Arnold. So, you know, that um, raises an interesting question, and we'll go into it in the next segment before we go back to the secret bases, and that is how often we have done things in secret and made people believe it was really a flying saucer. In other words, reverse secrecy. Or, to put it more precisely some sort of government disinformation working to a different goal. And by the way, if you want to reach us, you can check us out on Twitter where you can send us a tweet. We're known as The Paracast. Once again, we're known as The Paracast on Twitter. Or just check out our site, theparacast.com. Once again, that is theparacast.com. Pay us a visit. Mac Maloney joins us. The book is Beyond Area 51. With Gene and Chris, you're in The Paracast. Are you tired of searching for great talk radio? Something more important. Search no more. We are the GCN Radio Network. Is there a secret UFO agenda? Do strange creatures from the darkest corners of the mind roam the earth? Is there evidence for mind control, time travel, or devious government conspiracies? Find out the inside scoop on the latest conspiracies, paranormal activity, and Freudian phenomena when you subscribe to Tim Beckley's Conspiracy Journal. It's jam-packed with stories, special book and DVD promotions, and the best news, it's absolutely free, sent right to your mailbox. Plus, a bonus free email newsletter sent out every Friday. Simply send an email with your name and address to Mr. UFO at webtv.net. That's Mr. UFO 
at webtv.net. Find out what they don't want you to know. Are you still a traditional smoker? Now experience a new lifestyle and try vaping with e-cigarettes by LeSig. Imagine no ashes, stains, nasty smell, or coughing and hacking. With LeSig e-cigarettes, revolutionary microelectronic technology, rechargeable battery, and unique replaceable cartridge, you'll get all the benefits and satisfaction of smoking without the hazards. Choose your taste from a wide variety of our new American-made vaporeant e-liquids at LeSig.com. And LeSig smokes the competition by serving thousands of worldwide customers with real people customer service fast free same day shipping and a 30 day warranty and satisfaction guarantee so are you ready for a new vaping lifestyle then call 870-518-4307 that's 870-518-4307 or visit lesig.com spelled l-e-c-i-g.com lesig e-cigarettes for today's modern smoker Nutritious food is real body armor. It builds muscle, burns fat, improves digestion, and feeds the entire body the nutrients it needs. Did you know the U.S. government banned the hemp plant from growing in the United States and classified it as a Schedule One drug to hide it behind the marijuana plant? People have been confused about this plant for over 80 years, and many still don't know what hemp is. So now you know hemp is not marijuana, and marijuana is not hemp. They are different varieties of the same species. Hemp USA.org wants the world to know these basic facts and to help people understand that hemp protein powder is the best kept health secret you need to know about. Remember, hemp protein powder contains 53% protein, is gluten free, anti inflammatory, non GMO, and is loaded with nutrients. Call 888 910 4367. 888 910 4367 and see what our powder, seeds, and oil can do for you only at hempusa.org. Digestive health is the key to wellness and elimination of toxins. That bears repeating. Digestive health is the key to wellness and elimination of toxins. And Pro-EM-1 Daily Probiotic Cleanse is the key to digestive health. Pro-EM-1 is a powerful liquid probiotic, strong enough to cleanse, gentle enough to use every day. Pro-EM-1 is dairy, wheat, and soy-free, contains all natural and certified organic ingredients, contains no preservatives or animal products, supports a healthy digestive and immune system, supports weight loss, improves absorption, Absorption of food nutrients, aids in controlling yeast infections, is never freeze-dried, and uses three groups of live, viable, beneficial microbes to cleanse and remove toxins. Order Pro-EM-1 Daily Probiotic Cleanse at Terraganics.com, spelled T-E-R-A-G-A-N-I-X.com, Terraganics.com, or call toll-free 866-369-3678. That's 866-369-3678. Pro-EM-1, the raw probiotic. This is Kurt Southern, the author of UFO Mysteries, and you're listening to the Paracast. The book is Beyond Area 51, the other installations you may not have heard about where secret things are going on with Gene and Chris. Okay, so do you get the point, Mac Maloney, of what I'm saying? That maybe the military, our government, has used flying saucers as an excuse to cover up perfectly conventional testing. Yeah, I, I think absolutely they have done that because there's been stories in the past, they're not in this book particularly, but where they would test a new spy plane or something and and they would actually fly it over a city in the daytime just to see how many people would see it, just to see what their visibility factor was for this new airplane. And then, you know, but people would report, report it as a UFO and, you know, with the ridicule factor attached to UFOs, uh, you know, the story would just die out in a few days. Let me ask you the obvious question then is, do you believe there are UFOs? I absolutely believe there are UFOs. I mean, UFOs exist. People see them all the time. There's something like 1,000 reported around the world every month. And, you know, some of them, are, a lot of them are, you know, turn out to be kind of conventional answers. But there are, there's a good percentage that no one can explain them at all. Uh, they've been caught on film. Airline pilots see them all the time. Fighter pilots, military pilots see them all the time. They just can't talk about them. We see them all the time. Um, it's just that, you know, UFOs exist. We just don't know what they are or where they come from. And, and I don't believe the military knows 
where they come from either. They may know more about them. They more ha might have more like footage of them and evidence of them. But I don't believe that they know where they come from any more than we do. Let's go back to the bases. Okay. Now, are all the bases you're talking about in the book already known, or did you discover some new ones? Well, I didn't just discover any new ones, that's for sure. But they are certainly underreported or you know, never reported on at all because Area 51 always seems to get all the press, which you know there are, there are some people who believe that's just the point. Area 51 is the most well-known secret base in the world, and it deflects once again from these other places. Um, just ones that I didn't realize, you know, uh, existed. Uh, Pine Gap in Australia, I had no idea how extensive that place was. We look, we try to find uh, Britain's Area 51, and with the help of Nick Fern and Nick Pope, we come up with like a top 10, and we, and we go right down the evidence, and we think that we have found it at a place called Redlow Manor, which just happens to be near um, Stonehenge. Uh, there is a very strange place in China called Hanging Tang, which, um, you know, is just almost impossible to figure out exactly what's going on there. But but a lot of people think it has to do with UFOs. Uh, of course, in Russia, there's Kapustin Yar, which is a very another very strange place. It's kind of like a combination Cape Canaveral and Area 51. And they do regular conventional rocket blast offs there, but they also have nuclear weapons and exotic weapons there, and that place has, has a long, very long UFO history. Um, so I'm sure there are other secret bases out there that, you know, certainly we didn't discover them, and I think it would be very hard to discover them, but as my spook friend tells me at the end of the book, and the, and the book has kind of a surprise ending, even though it's a nonfiction book, if they want to hide something that is really, really, really deep, deep secret... They might not hide it at a secret base. They might just hide it in plain sight because, in the end, that's the best way and the best place to hide something like that. Chris, you want to pick up on some questions? Well, obviously, Mac, when we look at Area 51, um, the first thing that comes to mind is, it's as you mentioned, it's a red herring. It's like a way to focus attention onto a place that is you know, obviously secret. But I think it's really important to underscore what you were saying, is that there are things going on elsewhere. What, what were some of the most impressive uh, locations that you uh, list in your book and that you've researched and, and investigated? Well, the one that really struck me was uh, Autec down in the, um, down in the uh, Caribbean. Now, this is a place that it's a, that's an acronym, and it's a, it's, people call it uh, the Navy's Area 51. And Navy really has an interesting history with UFOs, because when people, you know, talk about UFOs, want to complain to the military about UFOs, it always goes to the Air Force, you know, because they're the Air Force, but the Navy always kind of gets a pass on it, but we know that they have never released any UFO files, even going back to World War II. So I was kind of surprised to find out that they had built one of their most secret bases literally right in the middle of the Bermuda Triangle, and it's on the island of Andros in the Bahamas. It's this highly secret place uh, that is next to a ocean trench uh, called Tongue of the Ocean. And once again, they do legitimate testing there because we talk to people who have been assigned there and also Navy people who have gone there for training. And, and, and what they do is they bring like the new nuclear submarines there and they test them out at these lower depths and so on. But the place is filled with monitoring equipment where they can see anything coming in the ocean for hundreds and hundreds of miles away. And it also has extensive radar and things like that so they can see anything coming in the air from hundreds of miles away. Yet we go into great depth. I just, I, I just scratched the surface of the number of UFO reports that have come out of that area over the years. Not just UFOs, but USOs, unidentified submerged objects. People in on boats and yachts in the Bahamas seeing UFOs come out of the water and fly away at, at tremendous speed. There's so many of them, we could, we could have written a whole book about them. So we just take the best. And, and so, but when people question the Navy about this, the Navy always says, well, you know, we don't believe in the Bermuda Triangle. We don't believe in UFOs. Therefore, we don't know anything about this. So what that tells you is that, that either all that multi-billion dollar monitoring equipment they have down there for looking for things in the ocean, looking for things in the sky doesn't work, or they're lying. They have to know all of this activity down there because they're wired for sound everywhere down there. Um, so I think that's a very, very interesting place. Why would this place that tests 
nuclear submarines, why would there be so many UFO sightings around it over the years? Um, once again, it's one of these bases that has a it's secret and has a long UFO history attached to it. Chris? I was going to mention that, Mac, also that area around the northeastern uh, corner of Puerto Rico, mm-hmm. around uh, El, El, El Yunque, I believe, uh, is the name of the, the mountainous region there, the, the park that's there. Quite a number of UFO sightings. The continental shelf drops off um, really dramatically right off uh, the coast of Puerto Rico there. And and like Andros, uh, what do you think about the possibility of underground uh, facilities or underwater, in this case, facilities uh, there? Do we have any sort of smoking gun evidence to suggest that we have an infrastructure underwater in that area? Well, I- I didn't see any smoking gun evidence. Um, I know Bill Burns, who I talked to when we put the book together, I know that he believes that, that there are, uh, could be underground, underwater tunnels there that actually bring submarines through these, into these secret bases that might be located under Andros Island. Um, you know, with any kind of secret base like that, you know, we're only going to know a, a fraction of the story. And, you know, really, who knows what's going on at these places? You know, but any evidence of... You know, UFOs or anything like that at the Navy's, quote-unquote, Area 51, you know, we couldn't find anything like that. But the but the interesting thing, again, just to repeat myself, is that so much UFO activity goes on near Andros Island, and I agree with you, down near Puerto Rico, too, but so much goes on around Andros Island, and we've just got so many newspaper reports and stuff that for the Navy to say that they don't realize this stuff is happening— they have to be misleading us because they'd be almost too stupid to do what they do if they didn't see this stuff happen. <laughs> well, you can't assume anything, but on that particular assumption, uh, one would hope that our Navy is uh, a, a, a little bit more vigilant than they claim to be. I agree with you. Of course, you also wonder at a time where military budgets are not increasing as much as they used to, whether these various secret bases are being closed down or maybe they fund them through a different method so the budget that we are aware of the public budget isn't involved like a black budget or something like that where do you hide the money in nine hundred dollar toilet seats as someone once said well if yeah we'll have to get the answer to that question in a moment have a couple of things i want to talk about first we have a newsletter. We have a weekly newsletter called, surprisingly enough, the Powercast newsletter. I haven't mentioned it too much, but it's very easy to get a copy. We have sign up forms on all our sites, or you can go to newsletter.thepowercast.com. That's newsletter.thepowercast.com. We'll sign you up in a jiffy. Now, each newsletter contains information about upcoming episodes of the Powercast and also a weekly commentary. Usually from me, but sometimes Chris writes it. We've had commentaries in the past from the likes of Stanton Friedman. Really fascinating. It's the Paracast newsletter. And once again, to get a copy, all you have to do is check out our site where we have these convenient sign-up forms. It is free. And by the way, we do protect your email addresses. We don't give them out to anybody else. Of course, the NSA gets it anyway. We can't do anything about that. Mac Maloney joins us. His book is called Beyond Area 51, where we focus on those other installations around the world where stuff may be going on that we should know about. With Gene and Chris, you're in The Paracast. The GCN Radio Network, providing the world with hard-hitting talk radio. GCN. Great talk radio starts here. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. If you'd like to listen to GCN programs on the go, I have great news. GCN has created a Droid and iPhone application, and it's free. Just as easy as going to GCNlive.com, click on the banner, and download. Before you know it, you'll be listening to your favorite hard-hitting GCN shows, live or on demand, right on your Droid or iPhone, 24-7 and on the go. So download the Droid and iPhone app free by clicking on the banner at GCNlive.com. Thanks again for listening to GCNlive.com. Again, that's GCNlive.com. 
Hi, this is Ted Anderson. Have you ever wondered why banks, stockbrokers, investment advisors won't talk about gold IRAs? They've been available since 1986, yet the financial industry won't recognize the value of gold for your retirement. Gold has outperformed paper investments, yet no word about IRAs. If you would like to have gold for your retirement, call 800-686-2237. Don't get left behind by rising inflation and low returns. Call 800-686-2237. Secure your future and call 1-800-686-2237. Got a simple question for you. Can you sell? Yes? Okay. Can you sell the intangible? If yes, and you'd like to work 9 to 5, Monday through Friday, with no overtime, no weekends, if you're passionate about not closing sales, but about opening relationships, if you truly have a desire to serve global clients who need your advertising expertise, and you're local to the Twin Cities and Burnsville, are hardworking, self-driven, with experience in sales, marketing, or advertising, are personable and a whiz on the phone, GCN wants to talk with you right now. GCN, the Genesis Communications Network, is one of the largest largest independent talk radio networks in the world and we're hiring right now we offer benefits and an excellent commission structure experience preferred but we'll train the right person is that you submit your resume today to advertise at gcnlive.com again that's advertise at gcnlive.com come work with the genesis communications network an equal opportunity employer Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. With Gene and Chris in the Paracast, we're talking about the new book from Mac Maloney called Beyond Area 51. And we're not just going beyond, we're going beyond, beyond, and way beyond, or something of that nature I haven't really gotten a handle on how far beyond or maybe we're going one step beyond is that a possibility you know you ever heard of that tv show one step beyond i used to watch it all the time all right so i guess the issue we're kind of focusing on here is what about hiding the money or having to cut back well i don't think they cut back um there is there are black budgets that they hide all the time uh, a special select committee of senators and i think people in the house uh, can vote on these things but they're always in secret supposedly the cia's budget is something like 35 to 40 billion dollars a year um other kind of classified projects that the military is going to get involved in especially if it's something that eventually is going to wind up in the hands of the cia uh, those things are also kept you know, uh, classified and in the black budget. So at one point, I'm going to say two or three years ago, someone told me that the the overall classified top secret CIA special projects budget in this country is somewhere between 70 and 80 billion dollars a year every year. And they really fight for that money. You can be sure the CIA has even it probably is. But the CIA is someone who, you know, as you can imagine, they, they, they just get tentacles all throughout Washington. And, you know, what a lot of those people are doing is making sure that they get all the money that they need and that they want. I doubt if they're going to be cutting back these days on anything having to do with classified programs, especially when it's anti-terrorism, things of that nature. But I know that what they are doing is that they're they're drawing in uh, outsourcing this stuff to a lot of people. I mean, that, that was something that happened after 9-11, where there was just such an influx of money for black projects, especially anti-terrorism projects, that they started, you know, farming them out to contractors. And I know that that is definitely in the contraction process, but I don't think the budgets themselves are uh, going to shrink. Okay, Mac, and all the work you've done in checking out these alleged secret military bases, did you ever find any stories about such bases that, well, didn't quite pass muster, did not appear to be real? You mentioned in an earlier segment how, for example, the stories about Bob Lazar indicate that, and I should point out to our listeners first that Mac has a fairly extensive section on this subject in the book Beyond Area 51. He basically said earlier that what Bob Lazar claimed wasn't true, that perhaps he was a disinformation agent. Right. Well, the the story about Kirtland Air Force Base and also Dalsai Mountain, which are entangled, um, you know, there's, I can tell you that there's nothing happening at Delsheim Mountain or Delsheim Mountain. 
Um, a lot of people in the UFO community believe that there are 50,000 aliens living inside this mesa in New Mexico, that they have some kind of mind control over us, that they're breeding us to become slaves on their um, slave farms on the moon and Mars. As crazy as that sounds, there are a number of people who believe that. Books are written about it. Lectures are given about it. DVDs are produced about it. Authors are interviewed about it. The basis of that story, it came from the Air Force themselves. There was a gentleman named Paul Benowitz who lived right outside and had a business right outside Kirtland Air Force Base in New Mexico. Who he um, It's kind of a long story, but he stumbled upon two parallel classified programs that were going on at Kirtland Air Force Base. One of them had to do with how to keep nuclear weapons uh, out of sight, out of mind of Russian satellites. And others, people believe he saw uh, the first kind of test um, uh, vehicles that eventually turned into the stealth fighter. He reported this to the Air Force thinking that they had some kind of UFO connection. And instead of the Air Force just sitting him down and having him sign a security document, which many people do every year, and telling him you've come upon something classified, please don't talk about it for the security of the country. Instead, they started feeding him disinformation to um, get him off track. And some of the disinformation that they fed him, this is the Air Force security people at Kirtland Air Force Base, you know, said, you know, turned into these fantastic stories of aliens living in Belcher Mountain and that, you know, aliens were doing cat mutilations and so on and so forth. And to the point where they actually drove him insane. He was institutionalized at least twice. And I think it's safe to say that he died a broken man. Um, there was nothing going on UFO-wise at Kirtland Air Force Base. There's nothing going on UFO-wise at Delsa Mountain. This was just another disinformation campaign that they chose to use instead of, as I say, taking the, the sensible, civilized route and just bringing this guy into their confidence a little bit and having him sign a national security document. Chris, you've probed into some of this stuff. What's your reaction to that? Well, you know, I agree. I, th I, I think I agree generally with what Mac's saying. But, you know, having uh, been pretty close to um, a number of investigators that have looked into the Benowitz case from all the way back in the early 80s, actually, um, there were a number of photographs that he took um, his trip up to Dulce with, um, I think it was Captain Edwards, if I remember correctly, from the Air Force uh, aboard a helicopter with special film supplied by the CIA, uh, kind of a little interesting aside there, they did happen upon some pretty interesting aerial activity. And in uh, Chris Lambright's book, Ex Descending, he reproduces some very, very high-res uh, versions in color of some of the objects that, that Benowitz uh, photographed over the Coyote Canyon Manzano Weapon Storage Facility, which you, you alluded to before, that do have some pretty interesting plasma, you know, ionized plasma, plasma effects on the outside of the craft. There's um, indications that, that there is some exotic technology going on uh, in at least some of the sightings that he, he was able to uh, capture on, uh, on film, and this is not video film. And some of the large format photographs from the trip up to Dulce are pretty interesting of an object that closed, uh, that closed in on the helicopter uh, at pretty close range. So there, there are some interesting elements about the, the, the Benowitz case that um, you can't just kind of throw it out with the bathwater, so to speak. But in terms of, of what is going on underneath Archuleta Mesa that straddles the border, uh, just north of Dulce. It travels the border with Colorado and New Mexico. Uh, and Project Gas Buggy, which was the explosion on December 10, 1967, of a 29 kiloton nuclear device that was exploded to, in an attempt to free up gas deposits um, located uh, about 20 miles outside of Dulce. Uh, there, there are some in interesting indications that there are that there is some sort of underground presence there. My, my personal um, hunch, hypothesis is that the Hickory Apache were paid off to bury some very noxious, illegal <laughs> nuclear waste on their reservation, which may account for the uh, you know very dramatic uh, increases of environmental cancer cases in the population around there. So. You know, if you read Project Beta, Greg, Greg Bishop's book, if you, um, if you uh, speak with Ron Regeer, who was uh, fairly close to Benowitz uh, right when all this stuff was going on in 80, 81, 82, there is 
tantalizing hints that he had stumbled on onto something that may not have involved the U.S. government. So, so we can't just totally debunk and whitewash the whole case, uh, at least in my opinion. And, uh, you know, when you look at Anthony Sanchez and, uh, you know, his book on Dulce with the, the geologists uh, hired by the government to find suitable sites for underground facilities in the 40s, and they stumble on, you know, the alien base under Dulce, uh, that, that sort of thing is... <laughs> It sounds like a good screenplay, but um, I don't think it has any any sort of real. There's no evidence to back it up, and really, you know, <laughs> right. we had we had Anthony on uh, the show, and and it, it was a little, it was kind of sad, but right. it was embarrassing. There was a section <laughs> on the show where he quotes as a reliable source this house name that Tim Beckley created for his books, called mm-hmm. Commander X. Which is just like a lot of publishers will have this name where they recruit different writers and they give them a single identity. Yeah, well, this is Colonel X. Yes, well, this is Colonel X, which is just about as bad. But he believed in Commander X, too. That's what made things more confusing. The (laughs) book we're talking about, though, is called Beyond Area 51. Our guest is Mac Maloney. With Gene and Chris, you're in The Paracast. Attack of the Rockoids has been well received by critics and readers alike. It's a thrill a minute story you'll never forget. A former U.S. military intelligence officer is haunted by intense dreams about a beautiful woman pleading for his help after a terrible battle in outer space. But the dreams turn out to be true and thrust him into a telepathic love affair with a woman whose faraway planet is intent on destroying the Earth. And now the gripping tale continues in The Coming of the Protectors. It's the second book of the Rockoids trilogy, a galaxy-spanning adventure that pits our hapless heroes against powerful, fanatical enemies that threaten the lives of freedom-loving beings everywhere. Attack of the Rockoids and The Coming of the Protectors, classic science fiction at its best, available now. For more details, visit rockoids.com. That's R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S dot com. Gold. If you listen to the radio, watch TV, or surf the net, you're hearing about gold. Eventually you will ask yourself, is gold right for me? The answer might surprise you. We protect ourselves and our families from many things. Do you have medical insurance? Is your home insured? Do you carry life insurance? How about financial insurance? If you own gold, then the answer is yes. If you don't own gold, the question is why don't you have financial insurance? We put our faith in things we trust. Do you trust the dollar? Do you trust the economy? Do you trust the government? Gold has always been something you can trust. For thousands of years, people have put their faith in gold. Where will you put your faith? Now is the time to protect yourself and your family. Call Midas Resources today at 1-800-686-2237, extension 242. 1-800-686-2237, extension 242. And ask for Jim Parker. Let me help you get started today. 1-800-686-2237, extension 242. Wouldn't it be nice to have one product that replaces more than 10, saving you space, time, and money? HempUSA.org has a complete full-spectrum vitamin mineral detox formulation called Micro Plant Powder Gold. Micro Plant Powder Gold contains 101 vitamins, minerals, probiotics, and iodine, has a 100-year shelf life, and is a perfect addition to any storage shelter. Make Micro Plant Powder Gold your choice. Call 888-910-4367 or visit HempUSA.org today. HempUSA.org has a revolutionary wonder food for detoxing the body and rebuilding the immune system. Micro Plant Powder can help unclog arteries and soften heart valves while removing heavy metals, virus, fungus, bacteria, and parasites. Plus, it cleans and purifies the blood, lungs, stomach, and colon. Keep your body clean with Micro Plant Powder. Order today at 888-910-4367 or visit HempUSA.org. Virtually anyone can hack your cell phone and track your calls, your texts, your emails, your every movement, but only if they can detect a signal. Stay one step ahead of hackers and Big Brother with a block at Pocket, a custom-made pocket infused with pure silver that creates a complete Faraday enclosure for your cell phone. For free shipping to the lower 48, visit BlockItPocket.com or call 888-315-9618, BlockItPocket.com. 
enhancing health and privacy. Stop wasting countless hours scouring the web for survival gear when you can visit GearUpCenter.com. We specialize in the latest, most innovative products you can't find anywhere else. Products like the Crowville Multi-Tool, Aquaponics Systems, and our fully loaded bug-out survival trailer. Tim Rawson here. I created Gear Up Center to bring you the latest quality-tested survival gear at the best price. Be sure to catch me again next season on National Geographic's Doomsday Prepper, where I'll be demonstrating my new Excalibur shotgun adapter system. Get the gear your life can depend on at GearUpCenter.com. And remember, prepare for the worst and hope for the best. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. With Gene and Chris, we have Mac Maloney, who has studied Area 51 and Beyond Area 51. He has a new book out called Beyond Area 51. And he tells me that's only one of two Area 51 books. It's kind of like what our friend Nick Redfern does when he writes a book. He's got several monster books out right now. Mm -hmm. So tell us more, Mac. Well, um, you bring up the name of Nick Redfern. He actually wrote the forward to uh, Beyond Area 51. It was very helpful in helping me uh, get some of the research. But I started writing 20 years ago. And the first thing I did is I had this action-adventure series out called Wingman. And we sold about a million books over 10 years in the 80s and 90s. It's kind of like a Top Gun, Mad Max, and a Jet Fighter type uh, series. So that went away in 1999, and I you know, went on to other things. And since then, I've got letters and then emails in the hundreds um, asking me when the series was going to start again. So when uh, we got a new publisher involved, and they're re-releasing the 16 original books, and they suggested I write another book to get the series going again, they said you can write about anything you want. And I had all this Area 51 research laying around my office. So I said, well, why don't I just write something else about Area 51? So it's a fictional account. It's called Attack on Area 51. It's a lot of jet fighters and dogfights and beautiful women and, you know, things of this nature that were always in the Wingman series. It's a $2 download from Amazon. A lot of people are getting into it. A lot of people like it. And it was just another way to start the Wingman series off again and it allowed me to uh, research two books at the same time. And you'd love to have Joss Whedon or Zack Snyder direct the movie. Oh, yeah, of course. Absolutely. Okay, but the guy who directed The Lone Ranger, you don't want him. Yeah, I don't think anyone wants him now for the next few years. Well, he also did Pirates of the Caribbean, so it's not as if he was... He's not out on the street, that's for sure. No, he's really not working out as well as we'd hope. but I'm disappointed. Either that's, of you that's, by the way, that's see- Gore Verbinski, by the way. Is did you see? Did you see the film? How was it as bad as people are making it out to be? The Lone Ranger. I had planned to see it. Then I saw the previews, and I read the reviews. And understand, with the Lone Ranger, I grew up at the end of the era of the original Lone Ranger with Clayton Moore. Mm-hmm. And you know, I thought there had to be some kind of middle ground, being a very saccharine kind of simple kind of show straight ahead for mostly for kids and having a wacky wild offbeat rendition in the movie why they had to go so far over the top is what really made it upsetting there had to be a middle ground where you can bring back the character of the lone ranger and have him do his thing without driving people crazy in a pg-13 film where there's a lot of very questionable violence but that's the end of the lone ranger for me He's not going to do your thing. But I bet that if he came to you and said, Mac, I want to do this movie. (laughs) Absolutely. Oh, yeah. You kidding? Anyone in Hollywood who would want to do a movie on one of my books. A couple of those Wingman books are actually um, optioned for Hollywood. But, you see, here's the problem, and this might be a little off track, but they had a lot of trouble making The Lone Ranger. They've been making it for about five years, and that's that's always a bad sign. And number two, they never do these kind of movies right. They, in my opinion, they, they have yet to do a Batman right. They have yet to do a Superman right. I'm talking about in the modern era. Uh, you know, some of the Marvel comic book films are okay, but you know, the, the, the reboot of Spider-Man was awful because they feel they have to elaborate on what's already a good story, where they should just do the good story. Well, in the case of the Chris Nolan Batman series, they relied heavily on the Dark Knight reimagining of Batman. Mm -hmm. And if you look even at Man of Steel, where I don't want to be the... I'm going to be the spoiler. At the end of the film, he kills 
General Zod by breaking his neck. And there's a lot of criticism saying Superman never kills anyone. But if you go back to the comic book, yes, he has killed Zod. So there mm-hmm. you go. It's your point of view. I think with Man of Steel, I liked it, but the final 45 minutes or hour was over the top. Well, that's what usually happens. I just happened to, there was a, uh, some channel was running all of the Batman movies, the ones that George Clooney and Michael Keaton were in there years ago. They ran them all in a row, and I was working, I usually have the TV on, and they just get, they just get worse and worse and worse as you go along. I and think then, if you look at the reimagining from Christopher Nolan and the first Batman film with Michael Keaton and Jack Nicholson, you'll see the approach is fairly similar in terms of this Dark Knight vigilante character. Let's get back to traveling through Area 51 and beyond. Let's get back to our paranormal universe. So the point to mention here is that you do accept the possibility that UFOs are real. Yes, I do. Uh, they have to be there. They exist. They exist. We just don't know what they are yet. But obviously you think that some of the givens in the UFO field, such as Roswell, and certainly I would assume Aztec would be in the same category for you, that you don't accept any of those things. What about any UFO crash anywhere? Do you accept any of well, the so-called crash st- stories? Well, the Aztec one, of them all, I think the Aztec one, from what I've heard, and, and um, I've talked to a few people who have researched that, you know, that, that seems to have a lot of evidence, has a lot of kind of credible witnesses. Uh, there are actually structures in the desert that uh, supposedly the military had to build to get the crashed UFO out of there. There's just a lot of kind of interesting sidelights to that story, and I, I give that more credibility than in Roswell. And the, the, the thing about Roswell that really bothers wow. me is what it's become. You know, it's now I forget what the count is, but there are some books out there that say that, you know, 12, 14, 15 UFOs crashed there and there's 30 dead bodies. And I want to know why are they crashing in Roswell and and wouldn't the UFOs avoid Roswell if so many of them were crashing there? Um, There was a story in in UFOs in wartime, my first book, where it talks about UFO presence over ICBM bases and how, you know, those things were, that was a real, those things were real. And lots of people saw them and the military once again knows more about those than they're letting on. But so many of those happened. And there was one particular ICBM silo where UFOs were showing up over it, even as they were doing the construction process. And when they put the missile in, there was so many, so much UFO activity around it that the, the guards refused to go out and, and guard the place at night. And that was right down the street. It, that was in Roswell, New Mexico. To me, that's, there's more evidence of UFO activity over that ICBM base there than anything that ever happened at Roswell. You know, let's just talk quickly about Aztec. Hotly disputed in the UFO field, Next week, we're going to feature, assuming there are no cancellations, a great debate on Aztec. Was the Aztec UFO case real or not? Fireworks are going to come out late this year, boy. We're going to feature Scott Ramsey, who joined with his wife, Suzanne, and Frank Warren, and other people in writing a book about Aztec and presenting the case for its authenticity. And we present somebody who has been very outspoken in his belief that nothing strange happened at Aztec. That's Kevin Randall. The great debate, Kevin Randall, Scott Ramsey, next week on the Paracast. We have a place for your questions in the question bank at forum.theparacast.com. And I suspect Mac Maloney will have questions that he will post there as well. And we'll have to see how these two people react to it. Basically, Kevin Randall doesn't just think it didn't happen. He thinks we shouldn't even bother talking about it at this point, but he's gracious enough to come on the show and debate his point of view. This is a first, unless someone else tries to scoop us now that they've heard it. The straw breaks the camel's back or something. We're not going to break anything now except the station, because you're hearing Mac Maloney with Gene and Chris. You're in the Paracast. America's number one source for independent talk radio for over a decade. We are the GCN Radio Network.
Graphic Converter is the image manipulation tool for the rest of us. It does not use any database. You get full control of all your files. Want to view the images of a folder? Drag it into Graphic Converter, and a powerful browser opens up to show your image files. You could use it for slideshows. You could use it to import images from digital cameras or from scanners. Need to do some image editing? You can do that, too, in Graphic Converter. Also, print catalogs convert from so many formats i can't even list them download now to see if graphic converter is good for you like one and a half million other users guess what you could save money when you buy graphic converter use the coupon code night owl use the coupon code night owl to get a special price for graphic converter go to lemkesoft.com that's l-e-m-k-e soft.com lemkesoft.com l-e-m-k-e soft.com what does freedom mean to you? How about the freedom to take control of your own future? At eFoods Direct, we're again celebrating Food Freedom Month in July. For every $329 you spend on our highly nutritious, great-tasting food, you will receive a $190 Patriot Pack free. For example, purchase a six-month supply and get three Patriot Packs free. The Patriot Pack is a 24-day supply of eFoods quick-fix, easy-to-store food, plus stove, fuel, and cook pot all in an easy-to-carry bucket. Patriot Packs are the ideal grab-and-go emergency kit for your car or to have by the back door. Perfect for your cabin or camping trip this summer or even simply to add more food to your supply free. Call 800-409-5633 or go to eFoodsDirect.com slash Alex and get your free Patriot Pack with purchase. Call 800-409-5633 or eFoodsDirect.com slash Alex and remember, free shipping every day. Hi, my name is DeRay, suffering from migraines, having Botox injections in my head and neck to alleviate pain, costing $1,500 out of my pocket. I discovered Dr. Ortman and Gentle Touch Chiropractic Adjustment called Nuka. I'm migraine-free since my first adjustment. Thanks for giving me my life back, Dr. Ortman. I wish they prescribed you instead of Botox. Thanks, DeRay. Putting the bones back in place is only half of the solution. We design a nutritional supplement program the body can handle and actually absorb, providing nutrients, targeting the problem area. Between Nuka and Nutrition, we will have you on the road to a faster and more permanent recovery. Look us up on the web at drwartman.com or call 952-303-9124. Let us help you feel better faster. Wellspring Spinal Care at 952-303-9124. Again, that's 952-303-9124. Or on the web at drortman.com. Have you ever consumed protein powder supplements? I have, and all of them don't taste that good. Have artificial flavors, sweeteners, or unhealthy sugars. About a year ago, I was introduced to a new protein powder that changed my experience. This protein powder made me feel noticeably better, and it tasted more delicious than any drink I've ever had. Here's the experience of one satisfied user named Rich. The term best of all worlds has been belabored to death, and yet I've just discovered a whey protein powder that truly deserves to be called best of all worlds. Best taste? by far. Best results by far. You almost feel like you're cheating that something that tastes that good could be so good for you. Thank you, Stephen, and Cocoon Nutrition. One World Way truly is the best of all worlds. The only way for me. Yours truly, Rich from Georgia. Real user, real happy. Call 888-988-3325 or visit oneworldway.com. That's oneworld, W-H-E-Y.com. Hi, this is Ted Phillips listening to the Paracast, and it's as good as it gets, believe me. Yes, this was a station break. I'm Gene Steinberg. He's Chris O'Brien. Mac Maloney joins us. The book is called Beyond Area 51. And an interesting point of view from Mac Maloney that he thinks if any of those early UFO crashes had a measure of authenticity, it wasn't Roswell, it was Aztec. All right. There you go. What about more recent events? What about Kingman, Arizona? Well, you know, I only know about that in passing. 
Um, I know that there have been a number of places that, like Kecksburg and places like that. But even if you look into Kecksburg, not to deflect, but if, even if you look into Kecksburg, I mean, there's there's a lot of evidence that that was, you know, a um, a Russian uh, satellite that crashed there. Um, we have a story. We have a chapter in in the book about a place I'm, maybe you've never heard of. Uh, it's called Ong's Hat in New Jersey. Have you ever heard of that place? Okay, I don't. I lived in New Jersey. Okay. Well, and you know, I didn't visit that particular place. Can you tell me where it's located? Okay, it's in the Pine Barrens, which I'm sure you know about. And the sure. Pine Barrens is this enormous kind of forested area in the middle of New Jersey that very few people know about because when you're driving down 95, you drive right through it particularly, and there's, there's no one lives there really. But we came upon this story about these twins, and there's a point to the story. These twins were uh, going to Princeton, and they came up with this theory called the cognitive chaos theory, where they claim that, you know, people could uh, jump universes just by altering their consciousness. And they got thrown out of Princeton for, um, you know, talking about these theories, went to Ong Tat, which is this very, very small town in the middle of the Pine Barrens, which in itself is deserted and haunted and so on and so forth. And they set up camp there, and they got some kind of underground scientists to join them. And after a few years, they actually perfected this method of jumping universes. And they were doing it all the time until Delta Force uh, jumped in there one night, destroyed the place, and either killed them all or they all went to another universe and never came back. Now, that's a real story that is, was started up on the Internet um, by a, an author named Mike Matheny. What he did was... In the early days of the Internet, of the World Wide Web, he wanted to start the first Internet myth because myths start usually around the campfire years ago, and then they just get elaborated on, on and on and on and on and on. So he wanted to start the first Internet myth, and he did this because he and his uh, colleagues would print, uh, would post these anonymous texts about what happened at Ong's Hat, and they waited, and, and, sur- and sure enough, other people started adding on to it and adding on to it and created this entire story from whole cloth. Now, the reason we put that in the, in the book and we ask, you know, we, we explain exactly what it is, and we have a, a gentleman named Michael Kinsella who has written extensively about it, and, he, and his theory is that when, people, when enough people believe something, then it com- becomes true. People accept that as facts. It's like a, a very elaborate game, a kid's game of telephone, where you tell one kid one thing, and by the time it comes around the room, it's completely different. Well, we asked in the, at the end of the book, maybe that's what UF, the whole UFO puzzle was about, is that is yet it just starts from one little thing, and people keep elaborating on it until it becomes this huge monster that no one can quite penetrate, and a lot of people don't want to dismiss. All right, so is this saying, then, is your theory... That UFOs, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy? No, what I'm saying is that they do exist, but there are so many people out there, and this is going back to what we were talking about with uh, Dulce Mountain. There are so many people out there who just put out things that, that they don't substantiate, that they don't do research into. They just make them up. You named a few of them earlier in the show. You just they named put them, them up. yourself. Uh, it, Dulce it, Mountain uh, is Archuleta Mesa. Right, that's what I mean, is, is that they, they become, so many people have heard it and add to it and, and believe it that they, in a, to, in a sense, they become real. So the question is, well, when you look at the overall UFO puzzle, what is real and what isn't? And I just think that 90% of it is just static, is just things that make no sense, have no basis in reality. And I think that really takes away from legitimate UFO researchers, uh, such as yourselves, to really kind of get to the to the root of this problem. Now, other people have said, well, maybe that's exactly what the military, the government wants us to do. They, they send out all these false signals all the way just to confuse us all. And maybe that's the case, too. But I really believe that things like, and I have to say, I'm sorry, Roswell being one of them, uh, Dulce Mountain being another, and there's, there's lots of other one, uh, examples that just cloud the issue. They just cloud the issue. And they're, they're, they're like a, a rock rolling down a hill that just keeps gathering more material all the time. Uh, we try to cut through that, and we try to say, well, this seems to be have happened. This seems maybe not to have happened. At, in the end of the book, I, and I'll, I'll do the spoiler alert, I question it, but I believe at the very end, UFOs definitely do exist, and they're mysterious because simply because our pilots, our military pilots and airline pilots see them all the time. 
and they are the experts at knowing what is a natural phenomenon and what's an unnatural phenomenon. And I, I've talked to enough of them to know that they're seeing something that can't be explained. Therefore, UFOs exist. So do you think the fact that they don't report these things very often is because they accept it or they just realize the futility of reporting it? Well, they're worried um, for their jobs. In the military, you, you do not report UFOs. Well, let me say you don't make an official report of UFOs or you don't talk outside of the military about UFOs or it's going to really have a negative effect on your career. And the airlines, you just never mention it to anyone because any airline pilot who sees a UFO is supposed to fill out an FCC report. If they do that, the next time you come up you know, for a promotion or whatever or you want to actually get a better route to fly, you're not going to get it because you're going to be labeled a flake, and it's going to just have a very negative effect on your career. So they never mention them. I know several airline pilots who I've talked to, I've interviewed, and they've told me stories that, you know, are, are just fantastic, to tell you the truth. And I know that they're telling me the truth, but they can't make these things public only because it will affect their career and their, and their paycheck, Frank. Reminds me of the scene in Close Encounters of the Third Kind, where an airline pilot reports a strange aircraft and then the control tower says, do you want to report this as a UFO? And he says no. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, well, and then they asked the other pilot who was nearby, they said, do you want to report a UFO? He says, I, I don't want to report one of those either. Right, <laughs> exactly. That's what it is. And, and a, a good friend of mine is a, is a pilot for an airline that is um, leased to the U.S. government. And, um, you know, he's told me some stories that I just uh, – that. Knowing who he is and, and knowing the credibility he has and the kind of job he has, I know that they're true, and they are fantastic stories. But we'll never, they'll never see the light of day because of the position that he's in, and it's the same with people who actually fly for the military. So the upshot is that a lot of things are happening, but there's no incentive for anyone to report it to anyone. Well, it, no, no incentive to report it outside uh, the military or outside the um, the airline industry, yes, for sure. I mean, you're never going to hear those people talk about these things. Someone told me, someone who was very, very close, and I'll, I'll try to get this thing quick, to uh, who worked for NASA and is also a UFO researcher, told me that, that someone and very high authority told them that since 9-11, the number of, uh, you know, scrambled flights for UFOs has, you know, gone up, you know, a hundredfold, um, where... Because we are now looking closer at any kind of an any kind of an aerial vehicle that is heading towards this country, because we have this idea of terrorism in mind. So more jets go up, more jets uh, check out these things. Sometimes they turn out to be you know something mundane, but as a result, our fighter pilots are seeing more and more UFOs because they're being scrambled more and more. Hmm, that's interesting. I never uh, thought about that, but it, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. When you're paranoid, you tend to create more scenarios uh, to be paranoid about. Well, it's, it's also, you know, I mean, th everything changed on 9-11 as far as the security of this country is concerned. And, and a lot of that has to do with scrambling jets to go up and look for things that might be heading for, you know, New York or Washington, you know, that, that shouldn't be heading there. And, you know, the vast majority of them are going to turn out to be something where someone's radio was turned off, whatever. But because we're doing it more often, our fighter pilots are seeing more legitimate UFOs because they're up there more often. Oh, if we could only get a handle on those reports. We have Mac Maloney. The book is called Beyond Area 51, which means it's not the only place where strange things are going on. With Gene and Chris, it's strange here. You're in the Paracast. <laughs> Are you tired of searching for great talk radio? Something more important. Search no more. We are the GCN Radio Network. Whether it's personal mail, whether it's business email, you want reliable, dependable delivery, freedom from spam, freedom from viruses. Well, Polaris Mail offers professional email hosting services for your personal or small business use. Each account uses 25 gigabytes of storage, an easy-to-use webmail interface, and full mobile sync. Sign up today for a 30-day free trial at PolarisMail.com, PolarisMail.com. So here's what happened. I was placing an order online. 
The site went down. It just stopped responding. It took hours before it returned, but I'd already placed the order with another company. If your site goes down, you could lose business. And if you have a business or personal site, you'll want to know it's easy to run and it will stay online. At iWeb, your site is hosted on one of the most reliable networks in the world. Check it out. iWeb.com. That's iWeb.com. Join us in Joshua Tree, California, August 9th through 11th for the Contact in the Desert UFO Conference. A weekend of in-depth exploration into ancient aliens, human origins, crop circles, UFO sightings, and new evidence of ongoing contact. The conference will feature films, panels, lectures, workshops, and field work with leading experts including Stephen Greer, Giorgio Sukalas, Graham Hancock, Jim Mars, Michael Tellinger, Laura Eisenhower, Jason Martell, David Wilcock, Doc Wallace. David Zareda, and many, many more of the biggest names in UFOlogy. The conference will coincide with the Perseid Meteor Shower, and the Joshua Tree Retreat Center offers the perfect place for sightings through the clear desert sky. Enter to win a free ticket at contactinthedesert.com. We look forward to seeing you in Joshua Tree in August for a serious look at mounting evidence that we are not alone. For more information, go to contactinthedesert.com or call 760-365-8371. Great news, pure water lovers. BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com has a special discount offer for all GCN listeners. You can't do better than a Big Berkey for economy. For only 1.7 cents a gallon, a single set of filters can last for 5 to 10 years. There's none better than a Big Berkey for emergency preparedness as a backup water source. And you just can't beat a Big Berkey to remove dangerous chlorine, all types of fluoride, pathogenic bacteria, cysts, parasites, and unhealthy bodies. Products from municipal water. Berkey water filter systems are even powerful enough to purify stagnant pond water. For the gold standard in water filters, get a Big Berkey at BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com. And all GCN listeners get 5% off all ceramic filter systems. For details, call 1 877 99 Berkey. That's 877 99 B E R K E Y. Big Berkey water filters for the love of clean water. Hi, my name is Scott Fuchs, teacher and rowing coach for over 14 years. I was sluggish, overweight, on prescription drugs, and only 30-something. Fortunately, I was referred to Dr. Z, and happy to say Dr. Z's all-natural protocols over a consistent course resolved my health issues. I'm in the best shape of my life, and most importantly, on zero medications. I'm Dr. Zdanowski, author of Evology, trained as a primary care physician, surgical manipulation under anesthesia, expert in nutrition, diet, weight loss, immune system, and I specialize in chiropractic. My 15 years of professional experience has taught me the four keys to vibrant health, a balanced musculoskeletal system, an integrated nervous system, a flowing lymphatic system, and a body filled with over 90 essential nutrients. This has been a secret too long. Actualize your potential, reverse disease. Call me, Dr. Z. 201-945-1177, 201-945-1177, evolveyourself.com. Hi, this is nuclear physicist lecturer Stanton Friedman. You are listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. We are traveling beyond Area 51. Let's look at some of the other alleged bases where things may be going on. With Mac Maloney, author of Beyond Area 51, with Gene and Chris on the Paracast. Tell us about some more locales that yeah, maybe what we're about not the hearing old about. Soviet Union, uh, Russia, sure. the M Triangle, and some of the interesting events that have been documented over there over the years. Right. In in Russia is, of course, Russia has its own, you know, very deep UFO history. They are certainly when the Soviet Union was was still, you know, existed. At one point, they asked everyone in their military that if they saw a UFO, that they should file a report, and a lot of these people did. And so the, the, the Russian government, or the old Russian government, you know, were inundated with stacks of UFO reports. They, they had the largest UFO reporting uh, agency in the world. The entire Soviet military at one point was reporting UFOs. But there were two places in Russia that we cover, and they really, they really are opposite from each other. Well, the first place is uh, Kapustinya that we talked about, and that's the place where it's a combination of Area 51 and Cape Canaveral. It's a huge base. 
that's been uh, operating since uh, the end of World War II. A lot of the captured German scientists that weren't lucky enough to come over to, to surrender to the uh, to, to the Allies and were captured by the Russians, and they were put to work there, and they put the Russians in space, just like German scientists put us in space. But there's a um, a very famous fighter pilot, female fighter pilot, Marina Popovich, who is someone who is the equivalent of, um, you know, let's say, I don't want to say Neil Armstrong, but someone who is very, very famous in our aeronautical circles here in the United States. She claims that her jet fighter squadron, you know, engaged in dogfights with UFOs over Kapustin Yacht on a regular basis during the 50s and 60s. And she's someone who, she's more like Chuck Yeager, let's say. So if Chuck Yeager came out and said, you know, I used to dogfight with UFOs over, um, you know, some air base, Edwards Air Force Base in California, I mean, there'd be a lot of people who would tend to believe him. Well, this is the same case in Russia. And she she's written a book about how, you know, they were always chasing UFOs away from Kapustin Yar and getting into dogfights with them. And, and finally, they, they kind of came upon this kind of unspoken truce that if the UFOs, they tended to hang around when they were going to, when the Russians were going to launch something. So if they didn't, if they didn't launch, uh, if they didn't scramble jets to interfere with the UFOs, then the UFOs would not interfere with the launch. So, you know, very, very strange place. Had a, had a three-hour UFO sighting there at one point where more than 50 people saw uh, this UFO that kept hovering over these nuclear storage devices. Uh, the KGB did an extensive report on it and interviewed people extensively on it. And, of course, you have to ask the question, who would lie to the KGB? So you have to kind of take what these people told the KGB as truth. And that particular sighting uh, had so much evidence that it actually went into a report that Lawrence Rockefeller, the brother of Nelson Rockefeller, uh, funded and gave to uh, President Clinton in the mid-'90s which had a lot of really good evidence to uh, of a number of UFO sightings. Uh, what Clinton did with it, no one knows. But, you know, because of Rockefeller, the name can open so many doors. He was actually, he was actually able to hand a UFO investigative document to the president of the United States. Well, we know our own Chris O'Brien had some goings on with Mr. Rockefeller. Mm-hmm. Well, he was an interesting guy. I mean, you know, finally someone who's a billionaire who was very interested in trying to get to the bottom of the UFO puzzle. And my hat's off to him. Um, what the other place in Russia, too, is this place that Chris mentioned before called the M-Triangle, which is at the exact opposite end of what's going on in Kapustin Yar. There's a, it's a 40-square-mile tract of land near the Ural Mountains in Russia at a very isolated place. And before the Soviet Union fell, they wouldn't let any civilians go into the place, though there's lots of reports that the KGB would go into this place. So, but when the Soviet Union fell and the Russian government came, became a little more liberal, they a lot of researchers and reporters to go in there. And it's just this very strange place. I mean, they see lots of UFOs, but lots of very odd things happen there. Like, um, you know, they'll be camping out in a very heavy, heavily forest area, and yet they, they hear traffic as if it's passing by them just a few feet away. They hear like a choir noise. People report hearing like a choir singing in this place. Um, supposedly the animals don't have any fear of humans. The fish come right up to you if you're in the pond or, or a stream or something. Supposedly, you can't make a cell phone call any from anywhere in the M Triangle unless you're standing in this place that they call the call box, and it's just a five foot by five foot square. That if you stand in the middle of it, you can make a cell phone call to any place in the world. People see the stars creating strange formations overhead. They see these odd spheres going overhead. Uh, seem to interact sometimes with people. But the most profound thing is that these reports that you know I keep kept coming upon where. People would go into the M Triangle and they would come out and they would be literally changed. Their personality would be changed. The Russians call it they would have a new soul where they would just have a, a better outlook on life. Uh, some people went in there with diseases and they were cured. The best story that we dug up was this gentleman who was washed out of the Soviet military, was unemployed, became a journalist, got a gig to go and report on the M Triangle. He was there for two weeks. And when he came back out, he suddenly had this knowledge of astrophysics and astronomy and regular physics and within... 18 months, he was a cosmonaut with really no formal training. In fact, People Magazine did a story on the guy just because of his being in the M-Triangle for a couple of weeks. And there's just dozens of stories like this about this place. It's just a fascinating place. And someone asked me the other day, of all the places in the book, where would I want to go first? I would rather, I would like to go to the M-Triangle first. Not the Bermuda Triangle. We don't hear much about the Bermuda Triangle anymore, Mac. Are there any recent stories that we can look at? Well, only that Autech, the Navy's 
Area 51 is they built it right in the middle of the Bermuda Triangle, which I in itself I find interesting. But, um, you know, that's maybe another thing that's been kind of, you know, um, overexposed or whatever. I, I still think it's a fascinating place because strange things do happen there. There's no doubt about it. And, and it really is a, a larger area than people think. It goes from Bermuda and it goes right down to that part of Puerto Rico that Chris was talking about, encompasses all of the Bahamas. There's all kinds of strange paranormal stories that come out of the Bahamas, strange uh, creatures living there and so on, and ghost ships and stuff like that. And, you know, the Navy just chose to build their secret base right in the middle of this place. I think that's interesting. Certainly a fascinating way to explore what's going on. Now, in your work with Chris, you talked to our own Chris O'Brien about the Mysterious Valley. Any interesting insights you can offer? And we're getting near the end of this segment, so we'll continue through the next one. I have to thank Chris for his help in putting that chapter together because uh, he's really the person who should be speaking about it, not me. You know, just reported a lot of the information that he was um, very generous in giving me. It, that would be the second place I would want to go. In fact, I probably would go there first. Just the, the, the number of things that happened there, and it just begins with UFOs. It goes to ghosts and shadow people and, all, and, and flying humans and, uh, you know, the works. Um, a very strange place, once again, surrounded a, a, a place that has many military bases around it, surrounding it, doing classified work. It, it just kind of goes hand in hand with these strange things for some reason. Just to add to the paranoia here, in the course of your studies and investigation to put this book together, did you run across anybody from military or intelligence saying, don't go there? Well, no, but... I have had a lot of trouble with my phones. I mean, that's the only way I can describe it. When I started promoting UFOs in one time about a year and a half ago, suddenly I started having trouble with my phone, being cut off, hearing echoing, hearing lots of static. And I've had people who work for the FBI tell me that my phone has been tapped. And I, I just don't want to believe it. And it. But it's only when I'm talking about UFOs. Uh, you know, I mean, we've had these phones here for 20 years, never had any problems with them. But when I'm talking about UFOs, it just seems that more often than is just coincidental, uh, I am cut off and hear all these things that when I describe them to people in the know, they say that's a symptom of your phone being tapped. So I, I think that there's a little bit of evidence, though. I can't imagine the government would have the time or spend the money to you know, eavesdrop on someone like me because I'm just someone. I'm not even a researcher. I'm just someone who's a reporter who goes out and compiles this information and puts it all in one kind of manageable text. But, yes, there's been strange activity on my phone, I have to admit. Well, now with the revelations about what the NSA is doing, I think all our phones are tapped. Well, all our phones have, they have the ability, they have, they have the ability to tap our phones, but they're not tapping all of our phones. That would be impossible. That's what they claim. No, they're, well, they're, they, are, they are creating a database of all right. voice communication, all uh, traffic cams that are they're tied into the net. You know, there's uh, a story now about traffic cams and about police departments around the U.S., all of whom, actually half of whom so far, are collecting information on your license plate. They record license plate numbers supposedly to be able to coordinate with crime databases to see if you're legal or not, or if the license plate is legal or if you're wanted for something. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it goes to show that there's hardly anything anybody could do where they're not subject to someone's scrutiny that maybe you don't want to invite. We've got Mac Maloney. The book is called Beyond Area 51, and as you see, we're exploring not just the installations, but incredible goings-on with Gene and Chris. You're in The Paracast. <laughs> The GCN Radio Network, providing the world with hard-hitting talk radio. GCN. Great talk radio starts here. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. If you'd like to listen to GCN programs on the go, I have great news. GCN has created a Droid and iPhone application, and it's free. Just as easy as going to GCNlive.com, click on the banner and download. Before you know it, you'll be listening to your favorite hard-hitting GCN shows, live or on demand, right on your Droid or iPhone, 24-7 and on the go. So download the Droid and iPhone app free by clicking on the banner at GCNlive.com. Thanks again for listening to GCNlive.com. Again, that's GCNlive.com. We 
the People Grow Cotton, Wheat Fabric, and Grave Inc. embeds strips and fibers to protect from counterfeit and carting to a private bank, having it lent back at interest, forcing taxes to service debt. This capitalism, or was Jefferson correct when stating a central bank issuing the public currency is a greater menace to the liberties of the people than a standing army? Ted Anderson, I'm placing a free silver dollar in a book that explains our monetary system. Call for your copy, 800-686-2237. It's time to understand the system. Call 800-686-2237. That's 800-686-2237. Did you know that gold and silver contain healing properties? It's true. Since the beginning of mankind's history, gold and silver have not only been used as real money, but also for healing our minds and bodies. Utopiasilver.com is your leading source for colloidal silver and colloidal gold, offering supplement protocols that can heal and enhance your health. Protocols for boosting the immune system, insomnia, yeast infections, herpes, and countering the effects of vaccinations and radiation poisoning. And now, Utopia. Utopiasilver.com encourages the use of real money with this buy one, get one free real money special. For details on your colloidal silver and colloidal gold supplements, call 888-213-4338 and ask about 50% off for first-time customers. That's 888-213-4338 or visit utopiasilver.com, utopiasilver.com, fighting for liberty and healing one American at a time. Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. So Chris is in the middle of an extreme going on based on the way his voice has changed. Kind of choked on that one, Gene. I know, I get choked up over it too. We have Beyond Area 51 is the book. Mac Maloney is our guest. And in looking at the liner notes that the publisher sent out, there's mention of UFOs and road rage. Pray tell, what are you talking about? Well, that uh, occurs down in Australia. And again, it's, it's very unusual that at least some of the stories that I came upon, where it seems that like the UFOs that are in Australia or sighted in Australia are really kind of, um, you know, they're, they're um, belligerent, I guess is the word for it. Usually UFO stories that you hear, they, they're mostly passive. And, you know, they're mostly kind of observing us or whatever. But down in Australia, there's a, there's a, a highway that goes through this place called the Nullabar Plain, which it goes through a desert from the cent- south central part of Australia to the western part of Australia. And it, there's nothing there. I mean, it's literally a desert and this highway that is the straightest stretch of highway in the world. And people travel this at night because it gets brutally hot during the day. And so many motorists have been, quote unquote, attacked by UFOs, harassed by UFOs there, that they put up a sign saying, you know, literally, beware of the UFOs if you're driving on this highway. We um, give an instance of this family, a mother and three grown sons who are traveling on the highway late at night, saw this light, thought it was a truck coming in the opposite direction, but it turned out to be something that was actually airborne. That just chased them, chasing this really kind of terrifying episode for these people. Finally forced the car off the road, and the people saw the UFO. They they smelt it. It was just really this kind of frightening UFO episode, and police investigated, and they said, you know, there's there's nothing in their story that you know tells us that they're making it up, and there's just so many stories that comes from this particular part of Australia, and the reason may be because there was a secret testing facility very close to there called Woomera, which was where the British government tested its first atomic weapons. There's no place in the U.K. where you can test an atomic weapon because it's so small. So they brought this testing uh, project out to Australia, took away Aboriginal land, by the way, by force, and started lighting off these nuclear weapons. And as soon as they did, all these kind of belligerent UFOs showed up, and, and they're still there. Very strange place. Australia's UFOs are different than any other UFOs in the world. Well, I always thought South America's UFOs were quite different. The sightings tend to be more vivid. Mm -hmm. Well, these are actually where they're attacking people and really just causing a lot of distress and things like that. I know that there have been stories uh, about UFOs um, in Brazil that have actually, like, attacked villages and stuff. But it just seems that this long, long history of UFOs in Australia, and and they really just started, you know, when uh, the British started lighting off nuclear weapons there. And then there's this place called Pine Gap, which is literally in the middle of 
the geographic middle of Australia, and talking about the NSA, this is a huge NSA listening station there where there's no one around except this base in a small village nearby. And, you know, whatever the NSA is doing, they're doing a lot of it there. There's been many reports of UFOs over this place and actually interacting with the people who run the space, seeing UFOs coming out of the mountains and stuff like that. So that might be a place that if we have our own UFOs, and I'm talking about the U.S. military, if they have vehicles made to look like UFOs uh, in a simply reconnaissance craft, and they're coming and going from someplace, there's a good chance they're coming and going from Pine Gap. Because we think of it being off the beaten track, we don't look at that place. It's really in the middle of nowhere. It's, it's more far out than Area 51. And there's just so many reports of UFOs landing there and so on and so forth that, you know, that would be the number one suspected place, in my opinion. Well, that, that brings me to a question from OS Prime, who is a fairly recent signee at forum.theparacast.com on our question thread for you, Mac. He has an interesting question. We briefly talked about Homestead Air Force Base earlier, and his question goes, I've noticed that some of these secret uh, bases governments have around the world are usually built on or near areas that have some sort of abnormal phenomenon occurring in the past. Being a native of Miami, I've always been curious to know if the building of an Air Force Base in Homestead would have anything to do with the supposed reverse magnetism used to build the Coral Castle just north of Homestead in Florida City. Any thoughts or insights? Interesting question. Right. Uh, the Coral Castle is, a, once again, it's a fascinating place. This gentleman um, who came from Eastern Europe uh, wound up there, and he built this gigantic kind of castle and all kinds of things, but would never tell anyone how he did it. And, and he certainly didn't have any mechanical devices that you would need to build something like this. How he did it is a mystery. I don't think anyone really knows how he did it. And I know that's very close to where Homestead Air Force Base used to be. In fact, I was going to do kind of a subchapter on the Coral Castle, but I just couldn't make that connection. You know, I couldn't make that connection to UFOs and things of that nature. So... Um, but I, I will say that, that it's a very interesting place, and Homestead Air Force Base in itself was a very interesting place, and they're in the same neighborhood, so who knows? Well, here's an, another question in a, in a similar vein in terms of, of the actual area. It's from Are You Insane, who is a recent signee up at uh, forum.theparacast.com. Uh, in answer to your question, no, I'm just curious, uh, hence the name, Are You Insane? I, I, Gene, I can't vouch for. Mac, I don't think you're insane. Uh, me... Maybe the jury's still out. I'll tell you what, Chris, I resemble that <laughs> remark. <laughs> well, Mac, do you think any of the legends surrounding some locales like Homestead Air Force Base may actually be targeted disinfo to distract the public from actual government military research? Well, well we know that they do those sorts of things in other areas. So, you know, there's there's no way I could say patently no, they don't do this. But as far as, you know, where you would actually want to build an Air Force base, a lot of that has to do with political considerations. You know, senators always want some kind of a military facility in their state because, you know, it generates a lot of federal income and, and people get jobs and so on and so forth. And, and these are the same notice- military people, by the way, who scream, the same government officials, senators and congressmen who say, no pork, pork, no, 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 oh, not all that yeah. money wasted. Oh, we've got a military base for you. Yeah, well, yeah, we want it here. Right. You know, no pork for anyone but me is usually what it is. And the majority of the military bases in this country, you know, are throughout the south and the southwest because the weather is better there. And, you know, when it comes to Air Force bases, that means that you can fly airplanes more than you could if you were up in Vermont or Massachusetts or something. So when they sit down and say, we're going to build a new Air Force base here, here or here, I really can't believe that, you know, the the fact that it might be close to some kind of paranormal, have its own paranormal history, would really come into the discussion. I tend to agree. I think it's more of a political and strategic uh, situation in terms of location. But here's another one from a longtime poster, Dave M., who's been posting here, man, six years now. Welcome back, Dave. We haven't heard from you in a while. He'll keep posting until he gets it right. That's an insult. <laughs> Don't take it seriously. Okay. Remember, you can ask questions of our guests at, and post them at our question thread at forum.theparacast.com. Mr. Maloney, you said you doubted that the die Glock or the bell ever existed. That's the Nazi bell project, which we've discussed with Joseph Farrell and others in the past. Your reasoning is partially because the Nazis don't have, didn't have the resources for their jet plane, the ME-262, 
So how could they build a time machine anti-gravity device? Um, what if they took all those resources and tried to, to complete a super weapon that might end the war in their favor? Supposedly the Nazis killed off all the scientists that were working on the Bell Project before they pirated the results away before the war's end, allegedly, I, I might add. That might be a reason why there was no one left to verify that all this happened. You also mentioned that the Nazis had no long-range aircraft that could fly from Europe to either Argentina or the Antarctic uh, to secret the bill, the bell away. It would seem that all they would have to do is fly to Africa, get refueled, and make their way to either location. The Nazis must have been in contact with some friendly African nations where they could have done a refueling. Just some food for thought. He says, um, I did enjoy your book, even though I'm not quite finished with it. So where do you uh, land on this? Last time you were on the program, you... You were a little doubtful that um, that there were such things as man-made UFOs and that the Nazis, uh, in, in your mind, were unable to complete any sort of research in this regard. However, researchers such as uh, Joseph Farrell, who I mentioned before, Henry Stevens, uh, there, there's been a number of them over the years, um, have some pretty interesting documentation that, that does suggest that possibly some of these uh, exotic uh, aerial platforms uh, made it to the testing stage. Where do you come down on that? Hold that thought. We have Mac Maloney with Gene and Chris. You're in the Paracast. Is there a secret UFO agenda? Do strange creatures from the darkest corners of the mind roam the earth? Is there evidence for mind control, time travel, or devious government conspiracies? Find out the inside scoop on the latest conspiracies paranormal activity, and Freudian phenomena when you subscribe to Tim Beckley's Conspiracy Journal. It's jam-packed with stories, special book and DVD promotions, and the best news, it's absolutely free, sent right to your mailbox. Plus, a bonus free email newsletter sent out every Friday. Simply send an email with your name and address to MrUFO at WebTV.net. That's MrUFO at webtv.net. Find out what they don't want you to know. On the average, Americans work between 45 to 50 years hoping to build up enough wealth to retire and live out their golden years. Unfortunately, with taxation, the rising cost of food, energy, housing, and medical, many retirees are forced to live below the poverty line. Is this a flaw free enterprise, or is our monetary unit we call the Federal Reserve Note forcing us into perpetual debt, ensuring inflation and higher taxes? These questions and more can be answered by reading G. Edward Griffin's book, The Creature from Jekyll Island. Congressman Ron Paul states it's what every American needs to know about central bank power. A gripping adventure into the secret world of international banking cartel. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. I will give a silver dollar from the early 1900s to anyone who purchases this book. Call 1-800-686-2237 and order a copy today. It's critical that the public be made aware of the system. Call and order your copy today at 1-800-686-2237. That's 1-800-686-2237. Do you owe the IRS money that you can't pay? Are tax liens and levies ruining your life? Are you tired of being afraid just to go to the mailbox? If this describes you, then Dan Pilla can help. Hi, I'm Dan Pilla, and I've been solving tax problems for more than 30 years. In fact, I wrote the book that made it possible to negotiate settlements with the IRS, and I've helped thousands of people do exactly that. Call now at 800-346-6829 to learn how I can help you. You know your IRS debt will not go away by itself, but you don't have to live in fear anymore. New changes to IRS policies will help more people than ever before eliminate their debts once and for all. There's no need for you to suffer another day with IRS debt. Call 800-346-6829. I can help you eliminate wage and bank levies, release tax liens, and negotiate a settlement with the IRS that will put your tax nightmare behind you forever. Call 800-34-NO-TAX or go to my website, TaxHelpOnline.com. That's TaxHelpOnline.com. Weakened by GMOs, stressed out about money, and blasted by the electric environment. Hi, I'm Pastor Jenny, and that was the state I was in back in 2010. 
Then I learned about RNA drops. I learned that 97% of my DNA that scientists have called junk is actually packed with millions of gene switches that play a critical role in controlling how my cells, organs, and other tissues behave. I learned I don't have to put up with disease, decay, or decline like I'd been conditioned to believe. I began taking RNA drops, a 100% natural formula designed to turn on those switches and provide me with amazing health and joy. Learn more about RNA drops and order a free sample today. Visit rnafreesample.com. That's rnafreesample.com. Or call toll-free 888-577-3703. Pay only shipping and handling for a free 30-day supply of RNA drops. Get the information you need and the health you want at rnafreesample.com. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. Okay, another long question from Chris O'Brien based on the comments from our listeners in the question bank at forum.theparacast.com. Our guest is Mac Maloney, author of a number of books, including Beyond Area 51. Mac, you've had a couple of moments there to digest the question. What's your response? Well, it's the same response as you know the last time we talked. And what it is is that, sure, the, the Nazis were always looking for better ways to build airplanes, to build fighters, and so on. Their scientists were really forward-looking. I mean, they're the people, one of Ron Braun and his crew or the people who came over to the U.S. and formed the basis of NASA and put us on the moon. So the Nazis did put us on the moon. There's just, that's a historical fact. But what's not a historical fact is the many claims made by people who say that the Nazis had UFOs, that some of these UFOs actually took play, it took part in some battles, some famous battles. And this, then this whole story of the bell, was it a time machine? Was it something that, you know, was, um, could go into space? You know, did it lead to a Nazi base on the moon, so on and so forth? You know, my response to it is that it's all nonsense. All you have to do is look at the numbers. To put together the U.S. atomic bomb, the first atomic bomb, took people working in 16 different states, and, and a lot of it was coordinated out of Oak Ridge. It took $25 billion. It took more than 150,000 people working on it, and it took them more than four years to do it. It was a very extensive program that left a lot of footprints once the atom bomb was finally revealed to the public. When we went into Germany after World War II, nothing even faintly close to any kind of a, uh, infrastructure like that was found that would be needed for the Nazis to be looking into time machines, perpetual motion machines, UFOs that actually could take part in dogfights, so on and so forth. And I really find this very disturbing. People who kind of look into these things, because in a way, whether they know it or not, it's just prolonging the Nazi myth as sup- as being supermen. And I just think that if anyone has the wherewithal to actually sit down and write a book about UFOs. I think they should write a book about UFOs that would get us closer to figuring out what they are and not basically make up these stories about what supermen the Nazis were. If the Nazis had this kind of technology, why did they lose the war? But it doesn't it sound more romantic to think that the Nazis were supermen or maybe we fell into the myth of their belief in their own superiority? Well, you know, I, I can't equate Nazism with Romanticism, okay? Yeah. What I'm saying, guys, is that this is the way it's treated in some books. We make something that was really pretty horrible, and we try to make it romantic. Of course, it's not. Well, that's misguided, in my opinion. You know, I've devoured uh, about five books that Joseph Farrell has written, and there's a lot of good research in there that would suggest that, unfortunately, because of the fast thinking uh, on the Allies' part with the invasion of Normandy and uh, some pretty um, pretty impressive generalship there in Western Europe, that uh, perhaps we beat them uh, to Berlin before their development curve and their their um, their actual you know the program to get these things operational was not completed. And I just find it very interesting that we, that we appropriate um, several hundred. Uh, Nazi scientists under under the auspices of of, of Operation Paperclip, and uh, among those uh, scientists, we also got a lot of intelligence operatives. And when the CIA 
uh, was started in 1947, our entire Eastern European and Russian um, espionage corps were boilerplated from the Nazis. Uh, and and Reinhard uh, Gerhardt, I believe, uh, was his name. Uh, was these these people were left in place, and instead of uh, owing allegiance to Germany, they all of a sudden were were our spies. If you look at Joseph Farrell's work and Henry Stevens and others, I, I, discounting it as fantasy. Uh, to me, is disingenuous. I, I don't. Oh, I'm think not. That I'm these, not saying it's fantasy. I'm. Uh, you know, there, there is a lot of very interesting documentation. Well, but they did not have UFOs that fought as dogfighters, and they did. Well, they do not have a secret base in Antarctica or well, a secret yeah, base on yeah, the moon. That's, that's, and they weren't. Then they weren't in communications with. Uh, you know, people who lived on Alderaan somewhere who were giving them, you know, all this advice and technical knowledge on how to build these things. And, yeah, this, and yeah, this is where a lot of this stuff comes with the bell. They had a lot, lot of very, a lot of very, very uh, forward thinking, you know, aeronautical people working there. And they put together some very interesting prototypes of planes. And, of course, they had the V-1 and the V-2 uh, bombs, uh, rockets. I mean, they were the first ballistic missiles, and the V-1 was the first kind of cruise missile. They did all those things. But what I'm saying is that there have, once again, like Dalton Mountain, there have been books and people go around lecturing and, and they go on radio interviews claiming that all this stuff is true, all this crazy stuff about right, the Nazis right. well, you being in you, 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 That I'm is fantasy. That, that is absolute Mac, fantasy. You can't lump Joseph Farrell, Henry Stevens. I'm not. I'm not doing that. I'm agreeing you can't with you. Lump those guys that to to the the fantasy uh, promulgators. You just can't. Uh, you have to differentiate between good research that that definitely is worthy of 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 scrutiny, and other people taking that research and then spinning it off into into fantasy land. There there is a difference. And my only my only point here is that there were certain things that were occurring in the skies over over Europe. During the latter couple of years of World War II, I'm talking about the Foo Fighters. What what do you think the Foo Fighters were? Well, that's what my first book was all about. You know, right. I mean, most of it was about. We don't know what the Foo Fighters were because um, where most of the reports came from Allied pilots, uh, both in the European theater and the Pacific theater. After the war was over, it turned out that a lot of German pilots and Japanese pilots saw them too. So it was this, you know, if you can imagine people sitting across the table from each other saying, we thought they were your secret weapons, and the Germans say back to us, we thought they were yours. No one knows what Foo Fighters were because Foo Fighters are UFOs, and no one knows what UFOs are either. Once again, did the Nazis have some really forward-thinking kind of aeronautical projects going? Sure. You know, I mean, Hitler would, would order something forward-thinking or what he thought was forward-thinking every day, and they people would have to go out and try to, you know, accomplish it. But and and what these people and I got to tell you, I'm not familiar with with very familiar with some of the names that you mentioned. But I can tell you this: that there is no nothing happened with this so-called Bell, and the Nazis did not have any kind of workable UFO-shaped aircraft that took part in dogfights over like Schweinfurt and places like that. Plus, there was no footprint of any kind of infrastructure that would suggest that the Nazis had anything more than a lot of interesting stuff barely off the drawing boards when we got into Germany and really looked at it. Plus, you said it yourself, a lot of the German scientists that came over to the United States in Operation Paperclip, they were, you know, debriefed up the yin-yang, I'm sure, by the CIA. Don't you think that some of those people would have been involved in these very exotic ways of propulsion? <laughs> well, don't Joseph Farrell shows that, that they, they were, and they were secreted away from the other scientists and, and set up uh, in black projects. Where are the results of it now? This is over, you know, the war has been over for so long, 60 years or more. Where are yeah, the results that, of that, it? That's a really good question. I think this is a whole uh, topic of, of conversation that the UFO community would rather, I think, uh, by and large, sort of put back in the closet and not really address it. And there's a few researchers that over the years have slowly uncovered quite a bit of very, very tantalizing research. I would recommend Joseph Farrell's books. Okay. Yes, Joseph Farrell has written some fascinating stuff. We'll get into more of this topic where there is an honest disagreement between two supposedly sane gentlemen, such as Mac Maloney and our own Chris O'Brien. With Gene and Chris, you're in The Paracast. <laughs> America's number one source for independent talk radio for over a decade. We are the GCN Radio Network. 
Graphic Converter is the image manipulation tool for the rest of us. It does not use any database. You get full control of all your files. Want to view the images of a folder? Drag it into Graphic Converter, and a powerful browser opens up to show your image files. You could use it for slideshows. You could use it to import images from digital cameras or from scanners. Need to do some image editing? You can do that, too, in Graphic Converter. Also, print catalogs. Convert from so many formats, I can't even list them. Download now to see if Graphic Converter is good for you, like one and a half million other users. Guess what? You could save money when you buy Graphic Converter. Use the coupon code NIGHTOWL. Use the coupon code NIGHTOWL to get a special price for Graphic Converter. Go to LemkeSoft.com. That's L-E-M-K-E-Soft.com. LemkeSoft.com. L-E-M-K-E-Soft.com. Time and time again. You need to come here and help us. We need assistance. Please. Those we should be able to depend on let us down. Federal and state and local officials saying help is on the way. Well, the folks here in Bell Harbor say show me. Don't depend on the government to save you. Take action now so that you're prepared for the next disaster. With MyPatriotSupply.com. Get the best prices on storable food, non-GMO seeds, water filtration devices, home canning equipment, survival and self-reliance books, and more at MyPatriotSupply.com. Call 866-229-0927. We are hurting down here, and we need help immediately. Before it's time to survive, it's time to prepare. MyPatriotSupply.com. MyPatriotSupply.com Hi, this is Steve Sanchez, and based on a recent study, it was found that 57 million Americans had legal issues over the last 12 months, but only 60% of those studied sought out the services of a lawyer. Why? In a nutshell, affordability. Well, my friends at Legal Shield have created a solution that can help you not if, but when you need an attorney. For as little as $17 per month, Legal Shield will provide you unlimited access to qualified attorneys at an accomplished law firm for advice and counsel on legal issues no matter how serious or trivial. For over 40 years and with 1.4 million families across North America, Legal Shield can help you, the loyal GCN listener. Representatives are standing by now to answer your questions, so call them now at 1-855-340-SAVE. That's 1-855-340-7283 or visit them at lsprotection.com. That's lsprotection.com. Ceramic Body Armor is rated to stop six hits. But what about the seventh? Unlike ceramic or Kevlar, Infidel Body Armor is proven to take hit after hit, and it just won't quit. Reasonably priced and designed for the smart civilian prepper, Infidel stops hundreds of hits from small arms to high-powered rifles. That means safety and peace of mind. Buy yours at InfidelBodyArmor.com. Spelled I-N-F-I-D-E-L BodyArmor.com. Infidel Body Armor just won't quit. When you need it the most, will your generator, power equipment, or vehicle be ready? Gas and diesel fuels go bad quickly when stored, and more than half of generator failures during disasters occur as a result of expired fuel. PRI fuel stabilizers keep your fuel fresh for when you need it most. Nuclear power stations, emergency service providers, and ships at sea rely on PRI fuel stabilizers. And you can too. Call 888-776-9373 or visit PRIproducts.com to find the dealer nearest you. Hello, this is Rosemary Ellen Guiley, and you're listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. With Gene and Chris in the Paracast, we have Chris debating with Mac Maloney over what the Nazis may or may not have done with their various inventions and stuff in World War II. Well, it's just the whole subject, Gene, of of man-made UFOs. I think our capabilities uh, aeronautically are light years ahead of what our government has officially and publicly acknowledged. I don't think Mac has any disagreement with that. I think that this technology goes back into the 30s, the development of this technology. Uh, Victor Schauberger and his Vortex uh, work, infinitely fascinating. 
Uh, the fact that uh, a German submarine was, I think, scuttled and, or captured and then scuttled uh, containing mercury that was on its way to Japan. Uh, there's some very interesting little vignettes here and there that uh, most people uh, don't know about that do tie into an overall kind of overarching picture that I, I feel deserves more research. I don't buy into these theories lock, stock, and barrel, but it definitely uh, is worthy of our further investigation and research. And, and Mac, I, I really enjoyed your first book when, when you were on the first time. Uh, was it UFOs during wartime, correct? Yes. Some of, some of the uh, events and, and reports that you unearthed in that book are, are really impressive. Uh, I, I think most people aren't aware of how extensive uh, the Foo Fighter phenomenon was, uh, for instance. And, and there are some very, very tantalizing clues that suggest that some of these things may have had uh, very terrestrial origins. So where do you come down with the uh, state of technology? What do you think of Ben Rich saying that we have the technology to take e with the capability to take ET home or everything that you could possibly imagine uh, we can do, that sort of thing? Do you think this is just uh, you know, kind of locker room boasting, or do you think that there's something behind some of the top aerospace experts in this country intimating that we do have a very exotic uh, capabilities and technologies? I've seen the, the Ben Rich, you know, quote, and, you know, I'm not really sure what the context of him talking was, but I will just go back to this. You know, if we had some kind of let's 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 just say there was some kind of really exotic technology that the Germans had and Werner von Braun and his group were the people, as I said before, who created the foundation of NASA and put us on the moon to put us on the moon, even though we did it in 10 years. It's, it's almost like the most inefficient way of getting into orbit and then going to the moon is to build this massive, massive rocket, the Saturn V rocket, to basically carry a thimble on the top to get us to the moon and then to shoot us, give us the power to get to the moon and then to come back. It's almost like flying and taking off in a huge airplane and then parachuting back. I mean, that's really how we went to the moon. If these secret German scientists, you know, had the secret technology, then why would we go through this whole facade of NASA and, and liquid-fueled rockets to get us you know, to break the bonds of gravity? Well, why aren't we using this secret technology? Why would we go through all that if this, we have this other really easy secret technology just sitting there? Why aren't we using that? And we had that kind of technology at our disposal. There, knew, there, there's knew some easy answers Let me just finish. That. Well, let me just finish. You know, if we had that kind of technology, why would we keep it a secret for the past 70 years? We, we, we would want it out there because that would make us even a bigger top dog than the United States is now. So, but you see absolutely no evidence of any of that. What you, the evidence that you do see is that the, the biggest and the best minds in aeronautical research that came from Germany started NASA. And the way that they got us to the moon was this ex incredibly expensive inefficient system of liquid fuel rockets launching thimbles into space. Well, it's like a card game. Sometimes uh, if you've got a winning hand and you don't need to show that ace in the hole, you don't show it. Um, if we're top dog already, why do we want to be even a bigger top dog? Uh, I mean, there are some political and psychological um, explanations for, for keeping that sort of exotic technology secret. Uh, Richard Dolan has uh, labeled the potential sort of this potential element within the power and control structure, the, the breakaway civilization. Perhaps all these things are going on, but it's all being done in secret. We, we don't know. Uh, w what I can tell you from my uh, years of investigating the San Luis Valley, which you cover in your book, is uh, I think a sizable percentage of what people were reporting as exotic uh, technology or UFOs was actually very homegrown. Um, even conventional craft lit up um, in such a way to appear to be high strange. So I do think that the, the government does play games in this uh, regard. I do think the government does not reveal the extent of their te technological prowess and, and capability. I think that there's a very plausible reasons for that. If you're talking about conventional control, why show somebody who doesn't have the control that you do and your, your top dog, as you put it, why show them something uh, else? Why not keep it keep it back uh, in in case of uh, emergency? I mean, there's there's a lot of rationale. I personally don't feel that we have the capability to uh, do some of the things that um, the wilder Fantasia types out there would have us believe. I don't think that we can uh, 
time travel, like Andrew Bassagio says. I don't think that we have bases on Mars already, bases on the moon. I think that these are these are confabulations and, and stretching uh, into the realm of sci-fi. But but I do I do really suspect that we have some pretty pretty far-reaching and highly uh, amazing exotic technologies, especially in the aerial platform realm. Well, I agree with you. You know, I I agree, but I I agree with you that, that, you know, there's probably some things out there that would blow our minds if we knew, um, you know, what they could do. But I also agree with you that, you know, I I believe that 99.99% of it has to be homegrown. And and even that 111% has to be, I I just don't think that, you know, we are putting anything other than what comes up out of a human brain into our weapon systems, our airplanes, our, you know, classified projects. I don't think there's anything paranormal or UFO related to this stuff because there just isn't any. I mean, there's a lot of stories out there. But there's just no evidence. There's no follow up. There's no evidence of anything coming from any of this reverse engineered UFO stuff that's supposed to be been around for decades. You know, the only thing I've ever heard that came out of a reverse engineered UFOs is Velcro. I mean, we are still doing things. We fly our airplanes, you know, by gas turbine engines. We launch our rockets by liquid fuel rockets. Okay, these things, uh, they're actually very inefficient. Um, I only say this because I used to work for General Electric and did work with their jet engine um, division and a a PI capacity. And, you know, I got a little bit of a knowledge on it. And and I can tell you that a jet engine is a very inefficient way. Very inefficient. And very expensive to operate. Right. Yeah, you bet. So if they had another way of doing these things, and if they've been sitting on it since the end of World War II, I I suggest they get off their asses and, you know, let's see it, you know, because time's a wasting. Well, what do you think of the the hacker, Gary McKinnon's assertion that he found uh, some document that that claimed that there are 150 off-planet naval officers? No, I, I mean, I think that's nonsense. I nonsense. think it's just nonsense. And, and what are they doing? I mean, that's, I've heard that, that you know, NASA, of all agencies, has the secret space force of these people flying around out to the moon and Mars and everything. Well, no, but it was are, the U.S. Navy was the, yeah, the quote. But, 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 but what are they doing? Are they just flying around out there, you know, looking around? And, and, and you know, do any of them get killed? Do they, is this thing, you know, is this, is this kind of a project that, you know, that never have had an accident? Uh, no one's ever died in the line of of duty, you know, and, and that means that all of their families would have to keep this secret and and their families would have to keep it secret. These days, nothing. It's very, very hard. Obviously, we know this now with WikiLeaks and things like that. It's very, very hard to keep a secret these days. And what's very interesting is we have never heard anything leak out of Area 51 other than the fact that they had some hazardous material problems there years ago. But there's never been a leak out of Area 51. I find that to be fascinating, and and that's either one or two well, things. So you're 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 asking the question, then you're you're arguing with with the answer that you give. We got to break it here, then we'll go into it in our next segment. All right, we've got an honest debate going here ahead of next week's debate, which will be on the Aztec UFO case. A lot more to come in the final segment this week with Mac Maloney, author of Beyond Area Fifty One. With Gene and with an ornery Chris O'Brien, you're in <laughs> the Paracast. Are you tired of searching for great talk radio? Something more important. Search no more. We are the GCN Radio Network. If you want to get your website online and you need reliable service, first-class service at the lowest possible price, there's only one place to go. Well, DreamHost has a special promotion with our show where they'll offer you unlimited disk space, unlimited bandwidth, one-click web apps such as WordPress, 24-7 support. You can save over $55. You want to know how? Go to DreamHost.com radio, DreamHost.com radio. Web- 
whether it's personal mail, whether it's business email, you want reliable, dependable delivery, freedom from spam, freedom from viruses. Well, Polaris Mail offers professional email hosting services for your personal or small business use. Each account uses 25 gigabytes of storage, an easy-to-use webmail interface, and full mobile sync. Sign up today for a 30-day free trial at PolarisMail.com, PolarisMail.com. Join us in Joshua Tree, California, August 9th through 11th for the Contact in the Desert UFO Conference. A weekend of in-depth exploration into ancient alien, human origins, crop circles, UFO sightings, and new evidence of ongoing contact. The conference will feature films, panels, lectures, workshops, and field work with leading experts including Stephen Greer, Giorgio Sukalas, Graham Hancock, Jim Mars, Michael Tellinger, Laura Eisenhower, Jason Martell, David Wilcock, Doc Wallace. David Serrata, and many, many more of the biggest names in ufology. The conference will coincide with the Perseid Meteor Shell, and the Joshua Tree Retreat Center offers the perfect place for sightings through the clear desert sky. Enter to win a free ticket at contactinthedesert.com. We look forward to seeing you in Joshua Tree in August for a serious look at mounting evidence that we are not alone. For more information, go to contactinthedesert.com or call 760-365-8371. Are you still a traditional smoker? Now experience a new lifestyle and try vaping with e-cigarettes by LeSig. Imagine no ashes, stains, nasty smell, or coughing and hacking. With LeSig e-cigarettes revolutionary microelectronic technology, rechargeable battery, and unique replaceable cartridge, you'll get all the benefits and satisfaction of smoking without the hazards. Choose your taste from a wide variety of our new American-made vapory and e-liquids at LeSig.com. And LeSig smokes the competition by serving thousands of worldwide customers with real people customer service fast free same day shipping and a 30 day warranty and satisfaction guarantee so are you ready for a new vaping lifestyle then call 870-518-4307 that's 870-518-4307 or visit lesig.com spelled l-e-c-i-g.com lesig e-cigarettes for today's modern smoker a little over a year ago, I began to do a lot of research into why, even though I had a pretty good-sized meal, that I was still starving. And my research led me to a well-known fact that most of the soils that we grow our crops on here in the United States and across the industrialized world are almost completely depleted of almost all of the key minerals and trace elements that our bodies need to rebuild themselves, fight off cancer, and be healthy. I then searched out the best vitamin and mineral company out there and discovered Longevity. The Longevity products are designed to give you the real nutrition you need, and once you've got that, you don't have to eat as much to be satisfied. I've lost 37 pounds in two months simply getting the vitamins and minerals I need. Check it out for yourself. It's incredible. Go to InfoWarsTeam.com today and order your first canister of Beyond Tangy Tangerine Complete Multivitamin Mineral Complex Dietary Supplement. That's InfoWarsTeam.com. This is Jerome Clark, author of the UFO Encyclopedia and other books. You're listening to the Paracast. Chris O'Brien had some responses to make to Mac Maloney about the state of our secret development, whether if we had recovered alien technology 60 years ago, why wouldn't we know anything about it? Well, you know what? Let's look at it this way. Take the people in 1920, hand them an iPhone, and tell them to reverse engineer it, Mac. Right. Well, I hear that all the time. Someone says, what would cavemen do with an F-16? But the point I was going to make about Area 51 and leaks is that maybe the reason you never hear any leaks coming out of Area 51 is that what they're doing there is just what they kind of say they do there. They're testing you know, our latest aerial platform, spy planes or whatever. You've never heard any kind of leak out of there about UFOs or anything you know, uh, that is kind of off the map like that. Now, I agree with you. What would someone from the 20s do with a, with a cell phone? I don't know, but they would talk about it, you know, and I think that maybe someone would be able to figure it out in the, in the 1920s. I don't know. I don't okay, know. Okay, but, but that I'm, also, 
goes back to your earlier statement. You think something might have happened in Aztec, New Mexico. So if they recovered a UFO there in 1948, where did it go? Mm -hmm. And what did we learn from it? Wouldn't it have been reverse engineered if it was an alien craft? We try at least. That I don't know. You know, I don't think anyone has the answer to that question. All I said about Aztec is that, it, it, to me, there seems to be more credible evidence that something unusual happened there than at Roswell. And one thing was interesting because I've talked to Scott Ramsey and his wife a number of times. And one of the things I like about their book is that I'm certainly going to tune in for this debate that you're going to have next week is that they put in these little details that you would never really think about. For instance, they said that when this thing crashed, whatever it was, and people, witnesses were gathered around it, and they were told the military was on its way, that the military, the first military presence, arrived in a helicopter. Now, helicopters weren't really, I mean, they didn't even have helicopters in World War II. Helicopters were a, a new exotic technology back then. And, and when people saw this helicopter coming, they didn't know what the heck it was, you know. Just those little details tells me, you know, maybe something really did happen there. But how do we know that what crashed there wasn't some kind of, as we were saying before, some kind of of our own top secret uh, vehicle? They would have they would have done the same thing. They would have, you know, recovered it. And I know they had to like lay a, a cement platform there so they could get a crane in to lift it up. And, you know, and I, I just don't know. All I meant about Aztec is that I just think that there's more credible evidence that something unusual happened in Aztec than at, for instance, Roswell. Well, um, you know, I, I, I really don't know what to say to that. I've, um, I've listened to both sides of the argument, both uh, the Ramsey's uh, side, I have the book, and um, of course, detractors of the, the Aztec case. Of course, it all falls down, I think, to the original uh, germ of the story in, in, in the Frank Scully uh, account. And uh, that is, is really fraught with a lot of questionable elements. Uh, there's some questionable characters that help get the myth started in the initial, uh, in the initial going. So I think the jury is going to be out on all these cases until somebody comes forward with some sort of physical proof, some sort of unassailable document, uh, material from a crash site, um, photographs that can be analyzed and proven to be real. I think anything short of that, we're, we're still just seeing the, the birth of, of new myth, the birth of, of cultural memes uh, that are propagated by the fan, Fantasia types out there who take these, these stories and then and run with it. You know, this whole, I just read the Ken Caston book, uh, Project Serpo, which to me <laughs> is one of the, I mean, it would make a great screenplay. Uh, it really would. But to take that at face value and say, yep, uh-huh. Yep, we went to uh, Zeta Reticuli. Uh, two of our guys died. The rest were able to come back, and and they lived out there. Uh, I don't know. I, I'm I'm with you on on having to suspend uh, my disbelief to only to a certain extent when it comes to a lot of these stories. Mac, um, are you familiar with the Ken Caston book and Project Project Serpo and that whole? No, uh, no. I, I mean, I I suppose I've heard about it in passing, but there's only so much I can read. You know. You know, some of the stuff that just seems too fantastic, and, and you mentioned a couple of people early in the, in the program, uh, what they have gone around saying. I, I mean, I, I, I look at it, you know, more in a humorous way, but it just bothers me. You know? <laughs> it just bothers me a lot that so much of that stuff is out there. And well, it, it, it doesn't bother me it's out there. It bothers me that people believe it. Well, it's out there because people believe it in and vice versa, but it really clouds the whole – what I think is the primary issue here the, is that at some point we have to get the scientific community to look into UFOs. And I know just like airline pilots don't report them, military pilots don't report them, no scientist, no credible scientist wants to get anywhere near investigating UFOs because it's going to be just They're a downer on his career. Right, exactly. But at